Woot indeed, Pro Cheeseburger. Woot indeed. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is going to be a, uh, a much more uh, toned down, relaxed, kind of chill and code session. We're going to be uh, building an automation lab from scratch. There's going to be all kinds of different components that are involved in this. Um, I have nothing scripted. Uh, I've done no research ahead of time. The only thing that I've done is I've taken four of my VMware servers and I've converted them over into Proxmox, but I haven't set any of them up yet. Um, I also converted uh, a earlier in the week, I converted one of my big boy uh, Dell servers into Proxmox. And I have a couple of VMs that are uh, ready for us. But uh, so yeah, let's let's kind of talk about like what we've got going on. I'm just gonna I'm gonna diagram this because uh, I think it'll probably be the best way of getting this uh, across. Let's see. We're gonna go to a Lucid chart here, and let's see if I can't do a little bit of etch and sketch for us. Ah, uh, they're gonna make me sign in, aren't they? Of course they will. Uh, we'll just yeah, Google's fine. Uh. <laughs> Google's not fine. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. This will be fine. Anyway, uh, we've got like a lot of different things, a lot of different components that uh, I, I've got to have set up here. Let me get my password all fancy. Like <clears throat> we're going to be again, we're going to be provisioning uh, hypervisors, uh, Proxmox. We're going to be uh, deploying uh, Ubuntu VMs that will be ultimately used to uh, deploy our Kubernetes environment on top of. We're going to be deploying Ansible. We're going to actually set up the Ansible environment. Uh, I did a I did a video on YouTube uh, late last year where we did the install of Ansible, but we never really kind of set it up. And uh, somebody had said, "Hey, you know, <laughs> can we get like..." the next phase, the next step of that. And I was like, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and now like three months later, here we are. So we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it today. Uh, let's see if I can't get this password uh, for here. I just wanted to do a little etch and sketch. Let me type this in here. Mm -hmm. Uh, as always, I'm going to be working from a, a Windows host, a, a Hyper-V VM. If you didn't know, if you run Windows within your home environment, um, if you've got like a, a Windows Pro desktop, uh, Windows, Microsoft actually gives you a free uh, virtual machine uh, to, of, with Windows 11. And it's awesome because like there, it's not bound to your Microsoft account, uh, so you don't need to... Uh, you don't need to sign in with your Microsoft account. Uh, it's it's super simple, really like that. So that's what we're gonna be using today for our stream, but let's talk about some of the components that we're gonna be deploying here. All right, so we're just gonna do a little etch and sketch here. Uh, we had NUC1, uh, we had, uh, I'm saying had because these guys have been kind of blown away uh, in, in lieu of today's live stream session. Uh, NUC1, NUC2, NUC3, and you guessed it, we got NUC4. Now, NUC1, 2, and 3, these are all i7 based. They're the same uh, chip within them. Some of them have NVMe. Uh, some, um, the others are just relying on a single SSD. I know that's going to be a problem when we get to, uh, to Proxmox. Uh, Proxmox on these, it's running LVM, Logical Volume Manager, uh, but like these SSDs are really small, like uh, maybe like uh, 250 gigs. They're pretty old. Maybe what we'll do is we'll set up like iSCSI and we'll we'll attach block storage from my NAS onto these. Uh, but these these four these were uh, previously running ESXi. Uh, they are now running uh, Proxmox. Let's see if I can get to the IP addresses here. I think the port is 8006 over HTTPS. Let's try that. Ah, all right. So yeah, here is our first one. There's some initial setup. Like it's been a while since I've done Proxmox, but what I learned when I converted my Dell server 
what I remembered when I converted my Dell server uh, to uh, Proxmox earlier in the week. I forgot. There's like a lot of and Proxmox fans don't don't ostracize me here, but I'm just speaking facts. Like there's a lot of kind of like, oh yeah, <laughs> you got to know how to do this and you got to know that. Um, and uh, it's it's not so much of an issue, uh, but like you gotta first uh, get the uh, appropriate uh, uh, Debian uh, package repository set up uh, for those of us that are not going to be paying a subscription for support. We got to update our sources so that we can actually uh, use the product and download packages. Um, you got to install Open vSwitch. It, I guess you have to is is a stretch of words, but for me, I'm a really big fan of Open vSwitch, and so there's a little bit of process set up in there, uh, VLANs and tagging all those types of things. Also, what I'm interested in is like these NUCs, I, I believe each one of these NUCs has like a USB network adapter attached to it. I'm gonna have to figure out whether or not drivers are gonna need to be uh, set up on that. But what I like to do is I like to have like a dedicated management interface uh, for accessing the hypervisor. And then I like to have like a dedicated uh, layer two trunk port uh, that's attached to my servers. And that's where all my VM traffic goes out. I like to keep those two things separate. I don't like an in-band management port where that's also chunking uh, workloads, but sometimes that's kind of a necessity. Uh, the NUCs are are kind of that necessity sometimes because they only ship with a single uh, network port. But anyway, so uh, we've got uh, HOU PVE 01 through 5. One's already set up. Uh, let's get uh, let's let's actually rebrand these. I'm gonna call this one PVE two, PVE three, PVE four. You guys running Proxmox in your environment? Be really interested to know what you guys are using. I love VMware. I <laughs> I know that's like a it's a hot take, especially in the home lab world. But I I really think uh, vCenter is like the cat's pajamas and. Uh, uh, and so it, it's, it takes a lot of convincing for me to, to consider changing to a new hypervisor. I'm still going to keep two of my VMware servers, uh, but these, these Intel NUX, they're just like commodity, uh, hardware. So I don't feel so bad, uh, just kind of allocating it to something different. All right. So we've got these five, uh, servers. This is what we're going to be deploying our workloads on. Uh, what I'm thinking, and I, I don't use lucid charts, so sorry, this is, this is not might not be uh, too eloquent of a of a read, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up Ansible AWX on uh, PVE one. Uh, I'm going to have a VM. Oh, I really wish I didn't do the note thing. Let me get rid of this guy. This is uh, my OCD is kind of kicking in. Uh, we're going to have a, a Linux VM that's going to be running uh, Kubernetes. So we're going to have a Kubernetes host. Um, and on that Kubernetes host, we're going to have AWX. Uh, we might install Nautobot on that one. Maybe I'll install Nautobot on a separate uh, virtual machine, maybe on a separate host. That probably makes sense. I know I have a, a SQL server on here as well. Well, I, I say that it's a SQL server. I configured a VM, but I actually haven't provisioned anything just yet. I mean, we're really starting from like vanilla, like <laughs> day one up and running type of uh, scenario. The AWX side, that's probably going to take about half an hour uh, for the install to complete because you got to not just deploy Kubernetes, but you also have to deploy uh, an AWX operator, which will then deploy the AWX application. And then there's a lot of setup that's required in order to get AWX kind of production ready. Uh, Nautobot, kind of in the similar situation, right? Uh, in that it probably take me probably a half an hour to get through the Nautobot install. What I'm also thinking of doing, because I've got a, a teammate that just reached out to me and said, hey, I've got a customer that's wanting to do some ServiceNow automation. Uh, and lucky for them, unlucky for me, over the holidays, ServiceNow, uh, they deleted my developer instance and they have not given me the opportunity to rebuild it uh, or actually um, restore the instance. So we're we're going to set up a brand new ServiceNow instance, and we're going to use that as our automation front end that will feed into uh, our AWX. Let's get an arrow onto here and kind of kind of flip this. 
Yeah. So ServiceNow will be ultimately, I, I don't know if it'll happen at the end of this, but ultimately ServiceNow will be like, we're, we're gonna create some forms uh, for doing like, hey, uh, deploy a VM series from Palo Alto on uh, this specific hypervisor. We'll have forms to kind of help us do that. Uh, and then we'll go through like an approval process and then it'll kick off an Ansible job that will actually provision those things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so we'll set that up. So I think between these three, like my, my cup's going to be runneth over. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is going to be a, a chill kind of session. Uh, not an enablement. We're not really going to be focusing on teaching you new things. I just wanted to take this opportunity to to spend a few hours on Friday to rebuild my lab environment because I've got some customer demos that need to be delivered upon. So here we are. Let's see, what's the first thing that we should start with? Let's get into our Proxmox hypervisors here so that we can uh, kind of, oops, DNS is gonna kill me. H-O-U, P-V-E, O-2, the tail.com. Uh, HTTPS, that should, oh, do I not? I don't have DNS working. Let's see if I can't set up DNS on here. Let's see, remote desktop. Now, don't laugh at me, please. <laughs> My confidence is shattered every time I do this, but uh, I actually use Windows servers to handle uh, network services within my environment. So uh, things like uh, uh, DNS and DHCP and uh, sometimes even Radius, uh, I will use a, a Windows server on a bare metal host to handle those services. N mostly because it does like it's a simple way of oh please uh, red tail uh, let's see what's my password it's a for me it's a simple way of creating like a cluster of um let's see cluster for those kind of vital services so things like dns and dhcp in my house i really don't want them to uh to break right and i I live in Texas, so I got a lot of power outages going around. So uh, let's see. This is, uh, my computer is not really happy. Let me try by IP, 1030.051. That is, um, yeah, that's the right IP. Uh, so let me log in here, administrator, and my super secret password, there we go. So I'm gonna create some DNS entries first for these hosts, uh, for these Proxmox hypervisors, and then we'll work on getting them all set up. All right, so DNS managers, you can see I've got three Windows servers. Um, they're they're a high availability, they're replicating across them all, just to make my life just a little bit easier. Oops, let's go ahead and create a new host here. Let's log in and say on Redtail, Here's my DNS host. Let's create a new one. First of all, let me make sure I don't have something already at this IP. And I do not. All right, we're good to go. Let's say a new host is going to be HOUPVE01 with the IP address of 1020.10.1. And there we go. And let's just kind of replicate this process. PVE02. 1020.10.2. You don't have to set up DNS, by the way, if you don't want. If you're, a, if you're a hardcore network engineer and you just remember everything's IP address, good for you. Uh, in my case, uh, I used to be like that, but my memory is starting to fade as I age. So DNS is my helper. It's a, it's a boon and it's a curse at the same time. Uh, 10.20.10.4 and 10... Show you PBE05 and 10.20.10.5. All right, cool. All right. So with that being said, hey, thanks for the subscription. Appreciate it. Um, so let's just uh, test our DNS resolution right now. Oh, yeah, we can just reload this page. Let's see if that comes through here. Uh, the port's supposed to be 8006, right? Let me just kind of poke around. NS lookup, HOU, PVE01.redtail.com. And 
And I want you to resolve to 10.30.0.51. And it doesn't look like it's replicated just yet. Let me point to a different one of the others within the cluster. 68, let's see, 11.2. Uh, nope, let's do 21.2. Yeah, 21.2. Okay, so the DNS has been entered for my host, but it just hasn't replicated across the others just yet. I think it takes about a minute or two. Let me log into this guy and see if he's got the entries. And 10. Dot, he does not. He does not. So <laughs> here I am touting like the benefits of using uh, Windows uh, AD servers for my DNS and now they're, they're causing a, a snafu, but let's just see. Okay. Now it's replicated to that server and it looks like my primary DNS server is probably going to take just another minute or so. That's okay. Uh, we can use IP addresses until that kind of comes around. Let's log into dot one. Oh, that's interesting. 10.20.10 dot dot is not responding. Maybe I've, oh, let's, uh, maybe my host is actually down hard. That would be funny. Good start to the stream. We'll see here. 10.20.10.61. Reload my page. And that's good to go. That should. HTTPS. There we go. All right. So. Let's log in with my root password. The root password will be set up whenever you install your Proxmox. Let's see, I do not have a valid subscription. This pop-up is unfortunately one of those nasty things about Proxmox that just, it's its a small annoyance, but it is an annoyance nonetheless. Um, I really wish I didn't have to deal with that. I did see a GitHub repository that was updated a couple of weeks ago that uh, is basically like a JavaScript hack that will prevent that pop-up. I'm kind of going up. You can remove the nag pop-up. Oh, cheeseburger. Please tell me how you are my friend. <laughs> um, let's see here. Cause I, I was looking at this project again, like on GitHub that was telling me how to do it. And I was like, uh, ah, this kind of feels like a hack. Uh, HOU PBE04 uh, port 8006. All right, so DNS looks like it's it's working now. We're gonna use that DNS resolution for our host now. Uh, let's see here, and one more, HOU PBE 058006. And one of my favorite things about uh, Proxmox coming over from the VMware world uh, is that there's no need for a dedicated management uh, appliance. Like in the VM world, we've got vCenter. And vCenter is awesome. Like, don't get me wrong. It is awesome. But they, uh, some of the functionality and features of the uh, of the platform are kind of gated behind vCenter. Like the read write on the API um, is gated. So if you're not running vCenter, if you're not paying for vCenter and running it as a VM, then you're not going to have like a lot of success with it. And that kind of, it kind of bums me out, but uh, if I recall correctly, there's a script for that. But each new version breaks it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like there's, it's, it's that hacky stuff, right? It's like, uh, and I'm okay with the hacky stuff. I write hacky stuff all the time, so I'm not trying to judge. Uh, but yeah, if like if you do your updates appropriately and your upgrade processes, then then the hacky stuff breaks, and then you need to. Let me go back. Yeah, it's a GitHub mentioned. Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, we'll we'll give that a shot because I I really want to not be annoyed with this. Uh, but anyhow, like you log into any of the hypervisors and you can see here we've got like the same management user interface, but it's not just like at the at the host level. Like if you log into a VMware hypervisor running ESXi, uh, and you log in through the web portal for that hypervisor you're only going to see the context for that local hypervisor, which I mean, at the surface level makes sense. But if you want like a single pane of glass for all of your hypervisors, well, that's when products like vCenter need to be inserted into the mix. And there's, there's again, not to beat on the point just a little bit too much, but there are a lot of really great features that vCenter uh, brings to the table. 
uh, that are, in my my opinion, it's worth the cost of the VMUG subscription. But since the acquisition from Broadcom, uh, I I've heard that VMUG might be out of the way. It might be going away. I don't know. It, it's all uh, rumors is all the only thing I know about. Right, the the tech industry's TMZ, if you will. Uh, but it's enough to kind of give me pause and to reconsider my commitment to vCenter and VMware if uh, if Broadcom's just going to do the Broadcom kind of thing like they always do. All right, uh, so this is cool. Uh, so again, uh, I logged into a single host. I can see the data center level, but in my case, I just have a single host at the moment. Um, I believe it's rather easy to add these additional worker nodes to my data center. I think what gets generated, I think there's like a, there's a key pair that gets generated at like the data center layer. And then you just like apply that, that cluster key uh, to the to the other hosts and they become members of the data center as well. And then you can just log in and see all of your hosts from a single pane of glass. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely need to go down that rabbit hole, but first I wanna go ahead and kick off the the Ansible AWX installation, because this is gonna be uh, the, the, the premier automation focus for uh, this environment. I use Ansible Tower or AWX or Automation Controller whatever you want to call the product, um, the graphical user interface for Ansible, right? Like uh, the thing with the API is like uh, that thing. I use that in almost every one of my uh, automation demonstrations with customers. Uh, people, people tend to resonate more when they see a GUI doing automation than when they see like lines of Python or lines of YAML or something along those lines, right? They they're, they kind of get a little bit nervous when you start showing them code. So a GUI is a really quick, uh, really easy way to understand what's going on here. So with that being said, let's look into this host right here. I have a, again, I've got two VMs on my, oh, hey, wait, here is a question for my Proxmox gurus. I've created a, uh, a template for uh, Ubuntu 22. It's I mean, it's bare bones. It's like just, I deployed the operating system. I did some updates to the packages and, uh, and then I shut it down and then I turned it into a, a cloned VM. My question for the Proxmox experts is that if I add other, these other hypervisors to my data center, can I use this template, which resides on hypervisor host one? Can I use that template for all of my other hosts within here. If that's the case, I'm in love and I'm hooked. Um, if it's not, then it's kind of a bummer. We'll just have to do a lot of manual things. Uh, the answer is yes, as long as it's cloned and not linked. Well, that's great because uh, I I kind of just, I only do uh, full clones. Uh, linked clones sound really interesting to me, but I, I get really nervous when there's like a dependency in the equation. Maybe I'm overthinking this, uh, but I get really nervous when I start thinking about like virtual machines that have dependencies on other virtual machines or other templates, start to get a little concerned around that. Uh, you have clones, you can push them out to any cluster. Super awesome, cool, thanks guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So with that being said, uh, let's log into this host right here. This is another really great feature of Proxmox that just doesn't get enough love. And that is the fact that like the, the web console is like spot on. It's really, really good. Uh, it, it jumps you right into uh, your bash shell. Uh, you don't need to leverage a tool like putty uh, or in my case, like I use Visual Studio Code, not just as my text editor, but also as my SSH terminal, but that not necessarily needed in this specific instance. Um, so, okay, let's look at the history. What have I done on this host so far? Um, looks like I emptied my history. Uh, I pinged, I did a, a NS lookup. I set my host name. Uh, I, this command right here, this will, will set the host name, but also I find it as a good practice to also update Etsy host to also update your host name. Uh, some things within your system will default to look at Etsy host first. So I like to make that change as well. Uh, I updated the packages and uh, upgraded them. 
Uh, let's see. There was one of the, a couple of the packages were uh, giving me a little headache, so I ran that command. Oh yeah, I updated the IP address. Let's look at my IP address on here. This is one of my favorite things about Ubuntu is that they use this, uh, they developed this product called NetPlan, which helps you manage your network config as YAML. Uh, it's just, it's so much better than uh, like uh, than the RHEL uh, way of doing things, which now is like all network manager CLI, which again, I'm really cool with, but I just think this is easier to maintain. Okay, so I have an IP address 1020.30.1 uh, default route out. I got my three DNS, my Active Directory servers here listed. Let me just do an NS lookup to see if I've got DNS working for my local computer. 10.30.1, and we'll resolve. It looks like, yeah, I've got working uh, reverse DNS for this specific virtual machine. So not really a whole lot to do here. Can I pop this out? I want to maximize this. Let's click console. And, oh, I really wanted that to be like this. Wonderful. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I need some help these days. Uh, all right. So the very first thing that we want to do is on this host, again, this is going to be running our Ansible AWX. And I don't really, I, you guys saw like the history. There's there's just not a whole lot going on here. Um, I've got a script. I'm using the word script with uh, <laughs> a lot of leniency here. Let's do C.65. I've got a uh, kind of a, a script that I used for the video. Uh, let's see, repositories. Uh, no, that's, uh, let's see, uh, GitHub just C.65 AWX up and running. Uh, and this is the, the script that we use to deploy. Oh, that's not cool. Where is it? Uh, there's an Autobot. We'll be using that here, but here we go. Uh, Ansible AWX. All right, so cool. What we'll do is we'll just kind of split my screen this way, and we'll just do a bunch of copy pasta uh, to, until we're successful. All right, very first thing, I'm going to be using a rancher for my AWX install. Can I get my paste cop or clipboard? Usually there's a permissions thing that I need to add that will allow me to paste from my host into the VM console. I do not see that opportunity here. Let's see, what is this? Oh, <laughs> that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> All right, so this button, everybody, uh, if you just hover over it, it'll tell you what it does, but my patience is like, it's non-existent. I just re <laughs> rebooted the VM, that's fine. No big deal. Uh, it's just the VM, it's not the actual hypervisor, but uh, if anyone knows how to get my clipboard available into the guest VM, I'd appreciate it. I might have to install uh, the guest there's like a, a, a Quimu um, guest agent. Let me see. I think it's running. It might not be. Uh, guest agent is not running. I wonder if I need to install the guest agent before I can get my clipboard available into the console. Not going to worry about it. We'll just type things the long way. All right. So the very first thing that I want to do is I want to deploy uh, Kubernetes on this host. It's literally just a single command. Um, I'm going to be using Rancher's K3S. K3S is a uh, cloud native foundation uh, certified instance of Kubernetes. It's really good as a single host, like a really lightweight version of Kubernetes, uh, but it can also be used with, uh, with clustering other devices. Probably not going to cluster, mostly because uh, working with load balancers drives me crazy. And I'd rather just kind of just do like a, a port a node port forwarding thing rather than deal with the load balancer uh, garbanzo beans. All right, there we go. So this curl script, again, it's just a bash script that's hosted by Rancher. Uh, Rancher is, uh, if you've never used them before, uh, it's a really great product. They were recently acquired a couple of years ago uh, by one of the Linux distros. 
uh, out there, but a really great way of getting Kubernetes up and running uh, with very minimal effort. Uh, the next thing I need to do is this line right here, and I need to change the permissions of my Kubernetes file. Now, in the, if you're not familiar, uh, in Kubernetes, you might see it called K8S. Um, that is, and there's eight letters in Kubernetes, so that, that's where the Kate comes through. Uh, Rancher, uh, this install is, is a lightweight version, so it's K3S. Uh, <laughs> take that for what it is. Uh, trivia knowledge for all my Star Trek nerds out there. Uh, Kubernetes, when it was in development with Google, used to be called internally uh, Seven of Nine. That is a uh, Star Trek character. Uh, but uh, obviously, because of copyright, trademarks, and those types of things, uh, they had to rebrand it into Kubernetes. Uh, so what I did right here with this command is I changed the permissions of this file. This is the default uh, Kubernetes file, uh, and I needed to give myself user permissions. So I'm, that's uh, what the dollar sign user is for, uh, k3s, k3s.yaml. So this is my... Uh, YAML file that declares my certificates and, and how to reach to me. Um, later on, what I'll do is I'll install a product called Lens that will basically be like an IDE to let me manage remote Kubernetes clusters from a single, again, single pane of glass. Uh, and, and it gets you away from having to memorize all the Kubernetes commands. Uh, really, really great tool. But I'll be needing this file at that time uh, in order to add it to Lens. All right, so we know the Kubernetes has been installed. We know that we've updated the permissions. Let's see if it's actually up and working. kubectl get nodes. And it looks like my node, I can see my host name, it is ready. Uh, it is in control plane and master. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a new terminology that this uh, uses. Um, it's no longer master slave. We've, as an industry, we've decided that there's probably some better terms to represent what this is. Uh, I think the uh, the worker nodes are now called workers or they're called agents. I don't remember, but we're gonna be using just a single host, so we don't have to worry about that stuff. All right, the next thing I need to do is I need to install customize. And this is too long for me to type out correctly. I'm just gonna, I'm just going to jump into this host and do things from the command line from here. Let's uh, SSH C dot into 10.20.30.1. Actually, let's test DNS while we're here. H O U A W X O one dot redtail dot com. Looks like we're good to go. Uh, we're going to say yes. And I'm just going to work from the bash. This way I can do some copy paste because some of these commands are going to drive me crazy. All right. Uh, so we're in the same host. We're just not using the console anymore. Let's paste this script. Now, customize is one of the many tools. There are several different tools uh, to help you manage deployment of services on your Kubernetes host. Uh, another very popular one is Helm. Uh, customize, I believe, is actually part of the Kubernetes project itself. Uh, even that being said, though, we still have to external, we have to uh, install it manually as a second, uh, second step. So that's what we've done. We've downloaded it uh, through and piped it to a bash script. And then that that installed it to a specific directory. And in this case, it installed it um, uh, to my home directory. And then I moved the uh, executable binary into my user local bin. Now to test this, I should be able to just type in, let me see if I can't, yeah, there we go. I should be able to type in which customize and if my system's path knows to look in user local bin, I will get a response back and it does. So I now see that if I execute customize, the system will look into user local bin for that because it knows that it's there. All right, so that's good. I don't need to update my path or anything like that. The next thing I need to do, so we have a working Kubernetes install, right? Kubernetes get nodes. Everything is healthy, everything looks good, but there's not really a whole lot of things going on. If I say git pods, for instance, it's gonna say there's no resources in the default namespace. If I ask it for all pods, it's gonna say, here you go. So Kubernetes itself uses containers to actually handle some of the, uh, the system components within Kubernetes. And that's what you're seeing listed right here. 
Now, what we need to do is deploy our first services on here, which is going to be our AWX operator. So I'm going to change into my var temp directory and I'm going to create a file called, oh, it's, it's got to be exactly this. So it's got to be customization.yaml. So that customized program that we downloaded, you know, the one that helped us to deploy stuff, it needs a file called customization.yaml and it's got to be exactly that. Uh, so that when we run the command, customize, uh, customize knows where to look. Let's take a, a little bit of this apart here. What we're looking at is a YAML declaration that will be consumed by the customized binary. And this is basically a set of instructions to say how to install the AWX operator. This is not going to deploy AWX itself. It deploys the thing that deploys AWX. Welcome to Kubernetes. <laughs> this is just how things are. Uh, so uh, basically it's saying, hey, I want you customization. I want you to look in this repository, look at this tagged release, and then deploy uh, this uh, uh, specific container image running this specific tag and do this all within the AWX namespace. There's a whole lot going on in Kubernetes. I'm not going to uh, go through all of these types of steps, but some of this information is, is good to know for the nerds out there. Now to initiate that build process, I need again to run customize, build, point to my local directory where the customization.yaml file is, and then pipe that output to kubectl apply. kubectl apply is like probably one of the, the, the most common commands you're gonna use in a Kubernetes world. It's how you deploy and update resources uh, and so we got some some good information that came back. Let's uh, let's go ahead and watch these pods here. So okay, so I'm running this command kubectl get pods show me everything in the namespace of AWX, and we can see here that the deployer the AWX operator is being deployed. Some containers are being created. Uh, this usually takes about uh, two minutes to complete. Let's uh, go ahead and type in. Let's append our command with, or prepend with watch. And what this will do is uh, it'll basically run the command every two seconds. So we should see an update here. What I'm looking for is some transitions in the status. Obviously running is good. Okay, now we got two out of two. So it took about a minute to deploy the AWX operator, but now it's ready for us. Clear our screen again. Now what I need to do is I need to deploy AWX. And the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna create another YAML declaration file. Again, these files are nothing more than instructions for Kubernetes. And I'm gonna paste in some new context into this empty file here. Let's, uh, there we go. Now what we're looking at here is another set of instructions uh, where we want to deploy the kind of AWX. This is something that the operator will know how to handle. Uh, we also want to, uh, again, name this AWX. This last part right here is me telling uh, uh, the Kubernetes host that I want to expose this service on port 30,080. Uh, this is a valid port range. I believe the valid port ranges for Kubernetes is like 30,000 through uh, the, the last available dynamic port, which I think is like, uh, 32, six something, blah, blah, blah. I forget my ways. All right, now I've got this AWX YAML file. Again, we can take a peek at it. That looks good. I need to add it to customize. Again, customize is looking for a specific file in the local directory called customization.yaml. So what I need to do now in my resources is I'm not gonna remove anything, but I am gonna add a new line, a new entry here. And I'm gonna tell it to point to my local uh, directory uh, for the AWX file. And then we'll just run, I think we just run that command again. Yeah, so the, we run the customize command again. And it's gonna say, okay, we've already done the first part of things. So you'll see a lot that comes back and it'll say unchanged, 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 unchanged. But this one's new. So we did configure a new role. Uh, let's see, anything else change? Uh, yes, we also have a new deployment for our AWX manager. And we also have uh, this new AWX app that's been created. Now let's watch those glorious logs as they go through. Now, this is interesting. I love this fact. 
Ansible eating their own dog food over here. They use Ansible to deploy Ansible AWX. Um, this process is, um, it can vary between 10 minutes on an SSD. I've seen as long as 15 or 20 minutes on a, a spinning disk. So uh, it mostly depends on the resources of your virtual machine. But I definitely wanted to, to kick this process off. Um, that'll give us some time to start picking away at our Proxmox environment. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump back in here. I'm gonna just kind of keep this into the background. This is just gonna be running here. Let's focus now on getting that Proxmox cluster environment set up. Again, I've done no homework ahead of time. Uh, so I'm going to be relying on chat to point me when I do something bone thick headed and I'm going to be relying on documentation as well. So let's start off at Google and uh, we're going to say uh, Proxmox uh, cluster data center uh, cluster manager Proxmox VE. Oh, uh, before I get a little carried away. I need to start doing some things uh, to kind of prepare my environment. I need to get these hosts ready first. And that is like adding the appropriate uh, uh, subscription and all that stuff. So let me jump into Proxmox One. Let me get into the shell of the actual hypervisor itself. And I'm gonna type in the word history. And this will reveal to me all of the things that have been done from the command line on my hypervisor. In this case, it's not a whole lot. There were some uh, some other disks in the server that uh, that needed to be formatted. Uh, they had some old LVM volumes on it. So that's what you see me doing here on lines four and five is I'm just kind of nuking those disks and then I'm formatting them and then I'm adding the, uh, the file system of X4 on them and I'm mounting them. So not a whole lot going on here that's really relevant. This stuff, however, is totally relevant. This is where we update the list of sources for packages on our host. And it's it should be your very first step. Uh, I remember I ran into problems using VI. Uh, so I, I did the same step using Nano. We'll use Nano. Um, hopefully no one gets offended by that. Uh, let's jump in on to host two. And let's go ahead and I'm logged in as root so I don't need to use sudo for elevated privileges. Let me kind of pump the screen up just a little bit. We're going to do nano Etsy. Uh, Etsy apt sources dot list. Apt sources dot list. All right. And I need to add a, a repository. Oh, look at me. Just doing Vim things over here. Pay me no mind. Let's, uh, let's look at what that looks like. Apt and sources dot list. I need to add this repository right here. Can I paste that? No, I cannot. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. No subscription PBE repo. No subscription PBE repo. Proxbox. And there we go. And... Uh, where is the one I'm looking for? So this is the bad one. Don't want this. This is, oh, it's not bad. It's just, it, it requires money and I'm not going to give them any. Uh, so we'll paste this. I'm going to paste this in. I can't paste it in here, can I? Ah, oh, I can. I love it. Good job, Proxmox with your console. Good job. All right. Uh, we'll exit this. Do I need to comment out any of these? What do I have on this one? I've got four that are good to go. All right, doesn't need to look, doesn't need to clean those out. So uh, with that, I should be able to do an apt update and apt upgrade dash Y and uh, enterprise unauthorized. It, that's interesting. It looks like there's still one of these that requires a subscription. I wonder why I didn't have to comment that one out. Uh, let's just copy it. Let's just move along here. Uh, host shell uh, nano Etsy apt sources dot list. 
And let's uh, control B. There we go. PDE and then X. Apt update. Apt upgrade dash Y. Just barreling along here, guys. <clears throat> Hopefully your week has been good. I, uh, for me, this is my first full week back at work for the new year. I'm really looking forward to a three-day weekend. <laughs> Please stand by. I'll get my boss calling me. All right. When the boss calls, you better answer. Uh, I have to upgrade. So, so uh, something interesting happened here. Uh, it looks like, okay, this one's going to go through, right? But these two, these are all complaining because of the repository that I have uh, enabled. See, we get this nice little 401 unauthorized. This is like one of the very first things that people run into a problem with their proxmox, they think they should be able to do this, uh, and they get this nasty little uh, error message. Uh, I just need to figure out <clears throat> which of these that I need to trim. So let's do uh, egrep dash v. I'm gonna say a pound sign apt uh, sources list. I'm gonna do a. Uh, quote dollar sign i'm being fancy y'all i'm just trying to show off uh i'm i'm trying to exclude any line that begins with a pound sign which would be a comment all right so these are those that are enabled on this guy and this guy is good to go it's my others that are problematic so let me figure out which one of these one of these things is not like the other let's do egrep v Pound Etsy apt sources list. Okay, so I've got bullseye main contributor, bullseye main contributor. A professional cheeseburger said, watch and learn. 
Uh, bullseye update, main contrib, FTP. I think that one's on here as well. Yeah, that one's good. Uh, download Proxmock. Okay, this is the one that we added, the no PVE, no subscription. Um, why is this failing, guys? Why, 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 why? Um, I wonder, do I need to, I don't think I need to reboot. Let's look at the documentation for a second. All right, that's, uh, that's that. This is this. Uh, these are the four that I need. Let's see. Test repository, not going to use test repository, not going to do anything with Ceph. These are the ones that I need. So let's do this. Let's just copy it uh, and revisit this list here. Push down and there we go. Is there a way in Nano to delete a full line like there is in, uh, in Vim? Let me just kind of hold this down to save my life. Let's see. Exit out. And let's do an update on my packages again. Let me see if I get that nasty 401. I did. I did. I did. Um, this is interesting. Maybe I'm overthinking this there might be another step involved here that i need to let's look at updates repositories ah there we go um deb. one of these i need to disable let's look at my repos this one the enterprise list ah it's in a separate list those sneaky guys all right so what you need to do is you need to just uh, come over here and uncheck this, right? Or, or uh, disable. Uh, so this this is the one that was giving us problems. It wasn't in the file that we were editing. Uh, it's in a separate list of repos. So make sure you come into here, you select it and you click disable. Uh, and now I should have success. Let's do that again. No 401, no whammy, no whammy. There we go. Cool beans. All right, let's re uh, replicate this. Come over to here, disable the repo, come up here and then update my packages. And that should go through, no 401. No IPv6, I need to get IPv6 disabled. I'm an American, <laughs> we don't speak that IPv6 stuff. Uh, <laughs> I love to hate on IPv6. One of the coolest technologies and probably the greatest failure of the networking industry. 25 years old and less than 10% adoption doesn't really speak too well for it. That's that's that fault is on us, by the way, the, of us network engineers. That's not the technology. It's it's us. It's our uh, it's we well, you know if they just made it backwards compatible. I say it like it's that easy of a thing, right? But uh, we both know it's not. Apt upgrade dash y. And there we go. Cool. All right. So we got some packages. We're doing our updates on here. Um, I am going to be installing Open vSwitch as well. I'm going to be using Open vSwitch as my uh, virtual machine uh, networking layer. Uh, I'm wondering, here's what I'm wondering. So like in the VMware world, we have a, there's like the standard switch and then there's the distributed switch. And what's great about the distributed switch uh, is that you can effectively uh, just deploy it across a single virtual switch deployed across your data center or uh, all the hosts that are attached to it. Uh, so a single point of management. I'm wondering if I can do that. I feel like I should be able to do that with Open vSwitch. I'm also curious if I can use the VXLAN feature of Open vSwitch so that I could ha I can make a virtual machine a, a VM tunnel over VXLAN and then terminate on a virtual firewall uh, running on one. So basically, what I'm thinking let's let's draw this out. I've got these. Uh, let's uh, kind of cut this out for now. Goodbye, service. Now we'll get to you later. So I've got these five hosts, and I'm thinking like from a, a, a layer two, from a networking layer, that we have this switch that's gonna be running like a OVS, open B switch, right? And each one of my 
uh, host has a connection uh, to this. We'll just we'll do straight lines. It's fine. So it's like a logical switch that all of my hosts are connected to. And I'm going to say, let's have one of these hosts. Um, green arrow. Can I do that? Sure. Um, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just drawing colors. But let's say PBE2 has a VM series firewall from Palo Alto Networks. What I'm thinking is that if I want to have a host on PVE3 and PVE4, remember these are NUCs. So I'm not gonna be able to put like a whole lot of compute workload on these guys. Maybe just a couple of VMs here and there. But what I'm thinking, what I wanna do is I wanna have a layer two connection from the VM to, uh, the, uh, to the network port that's terminating on the, ver the VM series on PVE2. I'm thinking I can either do that by just having a fat L2 trunk across the open V switch. Uh, if I can have the same open V switch across all my hosts, uh, or if not, I might have to VXLAN encapsulate it, or I just deploy a VM series on all of these guys and just kind of be done with it. One of the, the benefits of working at a vendor, right? You can have a bunch of lab hit. Right, this is not an economical thing that I expect most people to be able to do, but that's my idea. Uh, I don't know if this is the case. I know that I have today. I have PVE one, and it has an open V switch with the VMs connected to it, right? But it kind of just looks like, uh, kind of just looks like this right now. I, it's it's a single virtual switch that's connected to a, a single host. I wonder if I can replicate that. If you guys know, uh, so the VXLAN feature. You want is just to hide the L3 hops if you can't span the L2 domain. Yeah, basically, right? I, I, I that's it. Yeah. Uh, Cheeseburger loves him some nano. Yeah, I mean, like, hey, it's uh, it, it, it's an interesting debate the nano versus them versus Emacs, but uh, nano, nano is great. If if VI is acting up, then uh, then I'll default to to nano. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my thought process. Let me know if I can do a single virtual switch like it, right now it exists on this guy let's look at the network uh so i've got a uh, an ovs bridge right here uh and it's got some some network connections that are connected onto it right uh some internal ports so um this is trunked l2 and these are the vlans that are on my physical lan that are going back up to my switched network what I'm interested in is, can I extend this open V switch? Cause I know I can do it in on just Linux, just, you know, no KVM conversation uh, involved. I know I can do this in Linux, just do VXLAN, NCAP and DCAP. But each, actually I think all of those were individual open V switches and they need like static. Uh, I don't want to go down that route. I, th I think I'm, I think I'm overthinking this and going to end up with an ugly lab environment. Uh, let's see. Oh, cool. Hey, look, AWX is done. Um, it, it gave me a report at the end of the, the, the run it says that 75, um, uh, tasks were successful, 70 were skipped and one was ignored. If, uh, if you're nervous about this skipped, don't like a lot of what happens during the AWX deployment is AW uh, Ansible is trying to figure out, are you deploying this on OpenShift? Right, which they obviously want you to deploy this on OpenShift because that's their version of of, of Rancher in this conversation, right? Uh, OpenShift is their their own Kubernetes. It's fantastic product. I love it. Uh, they also have something called MicroShift. If you're looking to get more familiar with uh, OpenShift and you want to look at maybe an an alternative to uh, to Rancher K3s, uh, you can do MicroShift. Uh, I think this came out uh, last year. Uh, it's uh, uh, rel brave search. It sucks sometimes. <laughs> uh, micro shift, uh, shift here at uh, Kubernetes for edge computing. So I, I haven't kept up with a lot of Red Hat messaging over the last year, but I'm expecting this to be like a huge focus with Red Hat as they try to push uh, their product into the edge. Uh, micro shift is going to be basically the alternative to uh, to Rancher K3s. 
Um, and let's see, it's looks like it's pretty active. Um, so yeah, uh, this would be a good uh, thing to test on. I don't know if uh, there's a supported uh, AWX install, but again, if you're looking for an alternative or just a weekend project, give MicroShift a, a shot. Uh, so a lot of these skipped steps was Ansible making the determination, are you deploying on Kubernetes or are you deploying on uh, um, uh, OpenShift? And so these 70 are most likely those that are deployed on OpenShift. So, all right, uh, let's get out of the logs. Let's come back to our little uh, steps here and let's split this screen. There we go. Uh, so we've got the logs. What I need now to do is I need to grab the password. Um, I need to grab the password that's automatically generated for your AWX admin. And the command is intimidating if you don't kind of live in this Kubernetes world, right? It looks really ugly, um, but oh, that's what copy paste is for. Let's do that. This is, a, a, again, just it's another reason why using a product like Lens is so valuable. When when we install Lens, we'll be able to manage our Kubernetes environment through an IDE, and it just it makes things like finding secrets and decoding them, or um, finding your uh, the TCP ports that you're exposing or creating new services it makes all that just a lot easier. Um, all right, so it looks like we're up and running. I've got the AWX password. It's right here. Portainer is also great. You know. You say that I've heard so much about it. Let me let me deviate for a second. Let me look at this because uh, I have, I've never I've never given this a shot. Deploy, configure, and troubleshoot secure containers. It's a secure container. What are they doing? Uh, in minutes on Kubernetes, Docker, Swarm, and Nomad. Oh my God. I love Nomad. I wish Nomad had more adoption. I think that's, it's, I mean, like if we're talking like small versions of container orchestration products, HashiCore's Nomad is an awesome, awesome product. You gotta be good with uh, the HashiCore language, HCL, the, the, the data format. If you use things like Terraform, uh, obviously that's a, another HashiCore product, you'd be familiar with it. Uh, oh, that's a really pretty UI. Uh, let's see, dashboard, custom templates, namespaces, Helm built into it, volumes and cluster, okay. Uh, man, I like this. Uh, Zach, what date? We're live. We're live, baby. <laughs> Come on over, Zach, hang out. Uh, this is cool. I really like this. It looks like they've got some adoption. Uh, maybe I'll give this a shot too. Uh, is is this just a, like what role is Portainer really playing in this? Is it doing the actual container orchestration or is it just interfacing with um, like things like Kubernetes and Swarm? Is it just interfacing with those APIs and just giving you a dashboard or is it actually the container runtime uh, itself? I'm, I'm figuring it's the former. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Let's do. All right. Uh, this is cool. This is really cool. So it's just basically, is it a web web application or is it an IDE? Oh, you guys are talking to me. Okay, uh, 14 years old. It's just a dashboard. Okay, cool. That's perfect. Um, Man, you got me interested in this. Uh, let's look at pricing. Let's just see how they're actually getting money from this. Uh, buy a server, add nodes. Uh, hoo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Hoo. Okay, all right. Um, all right. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not jaw dropping, right? I, I want companies like this to make money because I want them to, to be able to survive and thrive. Uh, but oof, there is a free option. Okay. It's conveniently hidden from the UI. <laughs> oh, get started for free. All right. Let's see. First five nodes are on us. That might be all that I need. 
It might be. Uh, register, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, um, let's give them my name. Uh, my company is Redtail Consulting. And uh, my country, I am... I am a ginger in the United States. B. Rimsburg, my developer email, 8675309. Let's see if I can get away with that. I should be able to. Hopefully they don't multi-factor me. I'm a student, and have I used... Have you used Port Tanner Community Edition? No. Uh, I do not accept marketing. I do, I do accept terms of use, though. Uh, crosswalks. They should have Abbey Road as one of these. That's unacceptable. <laughs> they had such an opportunity to just nail it, and they missed it. Okay. Thank you for processing your five license. We'll email you. All right. Cool. We're definitely going to check into this. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to grab a uh, lens. Uh, lens, Kate's IDE. There we go. So uh, there we go. Desktop, and we'll we'll just do both. It's, I don't think it's gonna unless they removed it. I have a free business license that I keep using. All right. How many do you get with that license? That business license. I'm sure they they said it over here. First five nodes, professional enterprise, add 10 nodes, so five nodes. It says five, but I've got, okay, I've got it. Cool. I, I, I feel like this is acceptable. I think this should probably be $49 a year uh, for, for home and students. Uh, I, think, I think that's asking just a little bit much. How much is GitHub Pro? It's kind of my metric for figuring out like how to price things see like uh github three yearly uh team did they change their licensing again uh so like 44 dollars right and you get a lot of really good stuff with this obviously completely different products I'm not trying to suggest one over the other, but like if GitHub Pro with all the CICD and all the great uh, package repository goodies that you get, if that's $44 a year, I feel that like an IDE for managing containers should be around that same ballpark. That's a little bit much. All right, uh, let's go through the install here. Oh yeah. We have AWX working. I promise we're gonna we're gonna take a peek into it, but I want to add it to uh, to these container orchestration layers because it's just gonna help us manage the life cycle of those products. Any day now, Windows. Let's try that again. Oh, there it was. Only me, only me. I've got a pinky swear that I'm not gonna be using this in production. Uh, in order to to get a free license, I th I'm pretty sure Lens is is unlimited, um, but I might be wrong on that. I know that they do have a licensing uh, thing on here as well. It's kind of just a Scout's Honor type of thing. Okay, so let's do choose Lens subscription. Uh, I'm going to say for, uh, let's log in, free, choose, confirm. I do not make more than $10 million in revenue. Uh, so uh, let's see, let's create, uh, let's log in with GitHub. All right, uh, open Lens Desktop, open it on up here. And there we go. All right, cool. 
So uh, let's go ahead and add my Kubernetes host. I told you earlier that the the file is going to be stored in Rancher K3S K3S.yaml. So this is my Kubernetes uh, big secret thing, right? Um, and I need to add. So let's go file add cluster. I'm going to paste in my cube config file, but I need to change one thing, and it's this. It's the IP address. Uh, the IP address on my local host is 127.0.0.1, which we all know that is to be our home IP, our local host. Uh, let's change this to use hou uh, awx01.redtail.com. And let's just kind of move this. Again, if you don't have DNS, go ahead and cut that stuff out. Let's add the cluster. And let's uh, rename this. I'm going to name this awx and i want to have a pretty picture give me awx logo please awx logos assets oh these are these are really old that's going to be hilarious um let's look at the let's look at the favicon uh that's fine it's 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 old it's dated but it's fine we go SVG. I wonder if they'll let me upload an SVG or if I let's see here under downloads. Yeah, cool. All right, nice, wonderful. Um, reconnect. There we go. Okay, so now let me add this right here to my hotbar. Add to hotbar. Okay, so. I can close out of this and never revisit the command line for this server again. Uh, I can manage everything within this host now within my IDE. So if I look at the host layer, again, this works if, if it's clustered. In my case, we're just running single nodes. Uh, so I click on the host. I can get all the goodies. Don't really care about that. Um, what I care about is workloads. So here's all my pods in the default namespace. Let's change this to AWX. So now I can see Ansible AWX has got a few different pods running here. One of them is my Postgres database. This is really important because like you want your database to be outside of, of the actual containers themselves uh, that are doing the workload. That way you can handle things like upgrade processes and such and not, not be a big of a challenge. Uh, this AWX operator, this was the very first thing that we had deployed. Remember, we were watching containers 0 of 2, 1 of 2, 2 of 2. This is the thing that actually deployed AWX. And it 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 not just deploys it, but it, it monitors its life cycle. So if I scale down AWX and scale it back up to rebuild, uh, the AWX controller is going to be handling those functions. Into AWX itself, there are four containers running. You see these 1, 2, 3, 4. You hover over them, you can see AWX EE, that's the execution environments, the things that actually do the automation. AWX task, that is gonna be the celery uh, queue that actually um, uh, is triggered whenever you uh, execute a task. The AWX web, this is the graphical user interface. Uh, and Redis, which is the message broker in between the web GUI and the, the task. Uh, queue. That's, uh, I'm pretty sure they're using celery for that. Um, all right. So now let's, let's kind of like, I can dig into here. This is what's cool, right? Remember like that really long command to get into logs, right? We've got it somewhere here. Let me close out all this stuff. Close tabs to the right. Like these commands, these are really hard to memorize, especially when you're jumping into a container that's deployed within a, a pod that's deployed within a namespace. It gets really hectic, uh, really quick. But from here, I can just click on like the pod and then say, show me the logs for these containers. Show me the one for the web container, for instance, and we'll get uh, access into the logs. Uh, and I can change them. I can say, show me the tasks, show me the execution environment. This is gonna be important when you start running into problems with AWX, especially around things like execution environments, There are not a lot of indications when something's broken. Uh, a task might run for five minutes with no output and you'll have no idea 
what's going on? Is something broken? Do I need to fix this? Do I need to fix that? Uh, and so uh, the ability to kind of jump into here and lens and say, hey, like show me all the container logs for the tasks. This will reveal like, hey, you got an authentication problem or uh, DNS resolution is failing or blah, blah, blah. So again, just a really great way of getting into logs. It's also a really great way of getting into things like our secrets because AWX was deployed with a secret, but unless we know this command by heart, right? <laughs> like, like you're not gonna guess it, right? You, uh, yeah, you could probably Google it and, and find it, but there's just easier ways. And so uh, let's open up the config and here we can see all of the secrets. Uh, in my case, I can see AWX admin has been uh, generated. Um, this password right here is base64 encoded, not encrypted. Hopefully, hopefully you understand that there's a difference between encoding and encrypting, uh, but I can't just copy and paste this into my UI. I actually need to click the eyeball here to reveal the base64 decoded. Uh, so this is my AWX admin password. I know that because that's the name of it. Uh, this was created 36 minutes ago, um, and let's copy it to our clipboard. If you forget the port that you exposed your AWX service on, if you pick something other than 30,080 like I did, you can always come over into the network tab. As long as you're in the right namespace, like I'm in the AWX namespace, if I was in the default namespace, I would not see my AWX ports. But if I change to the AWX namespace, you can see the ports that are exposed here. In this case, uh, port 80, that's the container web UI is running on port 80, but it's exposed on port 30,080. The cool kids here probably know this, but uh, maybe not everybody does. Kubernetes underneath the sheets is actually running VXLAN between all of your container pods. So there's a VXLAN overlay. So there's a private IP space that's actually being used within the Kubernetes network overlay and then we expose it like we do with NAT, right? We expose a TCP port and we do a mapping between TCP ports. So that's what's happening here. Internally into the Kubernetes cluster for this specific namespace, uh, port 80 will be able to access the web UI, but anyone else um, on the local LAN will need to use uh, 30,080. Uh, 30, All right, enough of that. Let's uh, browse to uh, HOU AWX 01 port 30,080. And I get a TLS issue because that's the default of my browser. This is not running TLS, it's uh, running on HTTP. Yes, you can get TLS, you can proxy, you can do all kinds of stuff. It's, this is a lab, it's not that important. I'm okay with this. I, I blow these things away and rebuild them all the time. So it's, I, I don't worry about too much about a, a man in the middle attack or anything along those lines. But here we can see our web user interface. This is where we're gonna need to use that password that we had typed in earlier. So admin and then pasting my clipboard into here. Drum roll. Yes, I wanna save that password. I'll never remember it. All right, great. We've got Ansible AWX uh, up and running. Uh, it's ready for us to configure. I want to switch context again uh, back to Proxmox because I want these things set up before we get any further down the road. All right, so uh, we've got these guys. Um, I haven't installed Open vSwitch on them. Uh, let's see, I've got this OVS switch. You know what? I'm going to keep it pretty simple. I think I'm just going to... Uh, let's, let's just get these guys online and operational before we start going a little bit, uh, bananas over here. All right. So the first thing I want to do is I want to install open V switch just so that, you know, in Proxmox, you will have an option under network to create an uh, open V switch bridge and ports, but it will quickly tell you, Hey, uh, if you go through all this, uh, you click the create button, it'll tell you, hey, you don't have uh, Open vSwitch installed. You need to install this package right here. So we'll copy that to our clipboard. We'll jump back into the shell of our hypervisor. Let's say apt install Open vSwitch. Yes, and we're going to do this on all of ours. apt install Open vSwitch dash Y. 
Same with this one. Apt install open bswitch y. And apt install and be switch dash Y. Uh, you mentioned you work for a vendor. Are you able to say which? Yeah, uh, it's right here. I work for Palo Alto Networks. Uh, we are the cool kids in the cybersecurity space. Network security, cybersecurity, all those goodies. This stream is not sponsored by my 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 uh my employer by the way so anything I say on here is uh it's just me rambling uh, it's not the thoughts of my employer if that needs to be declared uh, okay so we should now be able to say uh, create open visa okay so let's look at these ports this is going to be that USB network device that I was talking about. Uh, and this is a wireless adapter. That's pretty cool. It picked up my wireless LAN. Uh, in the the Intel NUCs have like some of them have embedded wireless adapters. I'm not sure if all of them do, but I know that um, this one does. Uh, it picked it up. I wonder <laughs> can Proxmox do <laughs> wireless LAN? Can it join an SSID? Is that a thing? Uh, that'd be really interesting. But this is totally my uh, USB network adapter. What I'll probably do is I'll leave EN0, ENO0, uh, which is the um, which is my management interface that uh, VM Bridge is a tied to. I'll create another uh, VM Bridge interface that will be Open vSwitch, and I'll attach it to this physical network, and we'll just make sure that the upstream connection to my Juniper switches is uh, is layer two trunked, and that will be where our our virtual machine workloads will be deployed upon. I don't think I can do anything with a wireless adapter. Um, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what do I think about Paulo's container firewall solution? Uh, I admittedly know, uh, don't know much about Kubernetes or the other flavors like Rancher, uh, but the guys at work who insist that Paulo containers are way behind and don't uh, won't ever be viable for us. So uh, container networking, huge topic. like. Like we we just went down a, a very small smidget right here, looking at these TCP services. You have to understand that. Well, first of all, you have to understand how application workloads are deployed in Kubernetes. You have to understand the the container networking interfaces, what's called the CNI. Uh, there's many CNI networking out there. Um, it's kind of a wild wild west. Although it's starting to kind of converge around a few, like Flannel has been out there for a long time. Calico has been out there since the inception. Um, but there's also uh, opportunities where networking vendors are inserting themselves at the CNI layer. We're starting to see this kind of emerge. The reason why I bring up CNI networking is because your questions about container firewalling. CNI networking is basically like the container networking interface and it has uh, full access and control as to how networking configuration is, is performed across your, your Kubernetes environment, across multiple hosts and such like that, right? Kubernetes, everything's distributed. So you try to uh, kind of rally around unified points, especially around networking. Uh, so there's, there's hooks that are available within a CNI, a container networking interface, which expose several core functions that we as traditional networking people kind of take for granted, right? There's a lot of challenges in working like in a VXLAN overlay world. Uh, and so where I'm going with this is that if you do not have access at the CNI layer, there's going to be a lot of restrictions as far as how containers get inserted uh, as a firewall to protect the pods, to protect the container workloads within those pods. You pretty much need to uh, to have your CNI like really well defined and architected well, and then you can grab access into doing some of the core uh, networking things to funnel applications in through the the container firewall and then outside. Kind of like what we're doing here in the VM world, right? We're looking at deploying Open vSwitch and then kind of stitching virtual machine workloads in through a container. Or I'm sorry, in through a virtual firewall. Uh, kind of like in and out, right, through uh, separate interfaces. That type of design and architecture is really hard to pull off in the Kubernetes world within like the pod architecture. So 
when you evaluate containerized firewalls, first of all, a lot of times it's going to be the application people that have a really strong say as to how things are, um, the, how services are, are being deployed uh, for their their applications. It's got to, it's got to, you got to find the right firewall to ma match the right architecture. And uh, with the CNIs, um, with the network vendor based CNIs out there, it's still like, hey, we require a specific kernel version on all of your Kubernetes hosts, and you got to run this version. It's got to be this package. It's a really, really ugly thing right now. It's really difficult to pull off. So long-winded way of saying like, hey, uh, pick the container firewall that really aligns with the architecture uh, that you've got a rep that's built around your CNI inside of Kubernetes uh, and and uh, try to try to do the best possible. What I'm worried, what I'm concerned about is like, I don't manage Kubernetes on a day in day out basis. I work in sales. So like uh, all this that I'm doing, this is all my home, my lab, my fun time stuff. So I don't know all the kind of uh, challenges that a lot of like production Kubernetes uh, administrators see. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna be able to like really kind of pinpoint exactly uh, its strengths and weaknesses with here, but there's a lot of challenges. Just kind of make sure that you uh, align it with um, with your architecture. Uh, let's see, they aren't very viable. What other options do you like for controlling and monitoring traffic within the Kubernetes environment? So that's the problem. Like as, as like network security folk, we like to think that, hey, the physical firewall, <laughs> like, that's the end all be all, right? Like a lot of us networking people, like we love the physical stuff. We love the boxes. Um, we like in sales, like we love to sell boxes, right? Because it's, it's an easy thing to, uh, to deploy. It's, it's very familiar. There's like well-defined SKUs. Uh, what I have seen, again, I don't talk with a lot of Kubernetes administrators, but those that I have, they actually leave all the network security layer outside external to the Kubernetes environment. So they'll have like a DMZ uh, within uh, their, their network infrastructure, and that's where all their Kubernetes hosts will be deployed. And then they'll rely on the northbound firewall, either a physical firewall or a virtual firewall in this context, and that will handle the security. But that doesn't give you visibility inside the Kubernetes overlays, these VXLAN tunnels that we're talking about. If you want that type of visibility, you're gonna need, uh, or I'm sorry, if you want that type of uh, control over um, uh, of traditional firewalling mechanisms like advanced threat protection, DNS filtering, like the, the things that we do in the firewall world that are really impossible to do right now in the Kubernetes world, you kind of need a containerized firewall. Um, sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent. <laughs> we got work to do. Uh, I, I don't have a real strong answer. Um, uh, some customers uh, rely on the security stack to be uh, in front of the Kubernetes environment. Uh, I haven't talked to many customers that have actual production workloads in Kubernetes that have containerized firewalls. Um, previous to joining Palo, I did uh, come from Juniper. Juniper also has a couple of competing uh, containerized solutions that are built in different ways. The containerized SRX is is meant to basically be a, a protection at the pod layer, right? So in that case, like you're, you, you can control at the pod layer port numbers, uh, threat, blah, blah, blah. But that still doesn't give you complete insight as to what's happening within that pod because the container workloads can talk east-west without going and touching that firewall. So again, challenges, man, whole bunch of challenges. Uh, <laughs> it's a crazy world that we live in and it's just getting even more complex. All right, so uh, got OpenB switch deployed over here. Let's look on this one. This network device, I only have a single interface. Uh, Okay, what about this guy? Single interface as well, not counting the wireless LAN network. So I really only have one NUC with the uh, the network adapter. I don't think this is gonna be a really conducive to kind of break out a Linux bridge uh, for right now. Uh, uh, exactly, I'm interested in at least log, 
uh it's communicating what's tough yep yep i get you I, I i'm there with you i i wish i had more opportunities to kind of play in this world i love kubernetes but uh you know it's it's not my primary uh, domain of expertise um so let's start off uh, we've got these guys we've got our proxmox uh we've got the switching ready uh let's look at clustering these these bad boys uh so let's open up our google Let's go back to Proxmox Cluster Data Center. And let's see what we got to do for this. Uh, I'm going to skip over all that stuff. Let's get to the juice here. Uh, oh, we actually have to, we have to create the cluster. Okay, uh, do my CPUs have to match on the cluster? For three of my hosts, they do. For the other two, they do not. So we're inside the construct of a data center. I'm worried about the cluster because there's 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 some clustering technologies based on like uh, high availability and how you design the cluster. You have to have matching CPU architectures across the board, and these are just Intel NUX. Uh, they're they're not like real real servers. So you say. Um, Looks like we have to create the cluster name from the command line or from the GUI. Okay, let's try the GUI for approach first. Uh, let's see at the data center layer, a uh, cluster, create a cluster. We wanna call this cluster red tail. And uh, the host IP, that's good. Multiple links are used for failover. Yeah, I'm not going to get down the multiple link path here. I think that's fine. Well, let's go with that. Uh, Corosync. I remember seeing this. That's their cluster engine. It's been a while since I've touched Proxmox, but I do remember Coros. I remember having problems with it and trying to troubleshoot it. So I remember the name quite well. Okay. All right. Um, join information. Yeah, so this is kind of like what we were doing with the um, with Kubernetes, like adding that Kubernetes host to Lens. It's kind of the same thing, right? We we create a fingerprint or a config file, and then we we jump on the other host and we tell it, "Hey, join this guy." So let's uh, join a cluster, and uh, looks good. Oh, I need to set a password. Why didn't I see that before? Where was the option to set a password? Oh, I think the password is just like the, the password of your hypervisor itself. Let's try that. Uh, login succeeded. No cluster links passed explicitly. Falling back to the management IP. Uh, stopping the PVE cluster service. I believe that's on my local host. And I believe it's stopping this service so it can join the Corosync cluster service on the remote. We'll see. We'll see. What's the status here? Connection error. I wonder, do I lose local management access to the hypervisor if I join it to a cluster? Is that why I'm getting connection error here? Because PVE cluster service has stopped. Is, is my management interface effectively? No? Okay. So let me refresh my page then. Uh, ah, looks like the SSL cert changed. Interesting. Uh, the errors and it just works. Okay. Ah, look at that. Cool, cool, cool. So now my data center, I'm logged in to the host two and I see both of them. So I can probably start closing out some tabs as we kind of knock this out. Uh, let's jump onto host three and cluster, join cluster, paste info and my hypervisor's password, join. And Denied. Most guides say, don't worry about that error. <laughs> I love the open source world. Hilarious. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's screaming bloody murder, but don't worry. It's totally cool. 
Ah, I love it. I love it. All right, uh, let me uh, refresh this page. Has anyone got uh, <clears throat> uh, Let's Encrypt protecting your uh, your hypervisors or uh, or something similar? Um, anyone using like a certificate CRL maybe to uh, to get the TLS in these guys? Uh, yep, yeah. Nginx Proxy Manager. Man, there's so much stuff. Like I, I don't know how to do that. I haven't done that yet. Um, sounds like a good weekend. Hey, uh, by the way, let me go ahead and take this opportunity to plug one of my favorite YouTube channels. Um, there's a lot of really great content creators out there. One of my all-time favorites is this guy named Techno Tim. If you ever want some content to go through to learn or build stuff. This is like, like there's a lot of great YouTubers out there that are focused to like on like introduction, like intro, intro to IT stuff, intro to networking. This is not that. This is for those of us that kind of like geek out on tech details. Uh, he does do some clickbait like thumbnails. Oh my God, I love it. Uh, but like this guy's channel is awesome. Uh, I think he probably runs Proxmox too somewhere. Um, anyway. Great, a great guy, uh, great uh, YouTube content. If you ever have an opportunity, go check him out. Uh, let's see here. So I'm thinking, the reason why I bring up Technotem is you mentioned Nginx. Uh, we're talking SSL certs. I know he does a lot of uh, goodies around uh, um, SSL. SSL or TLS. So yeah, this was one of the videos I watched a year ago about this. I'm wondering if this is uh this is kind of where your your thought process was going, Mr. Pro Cheeseburger. Uh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh so okay, we're done with that guy and we're almost finished here. Let's come up with here. I can't believe how easy this is. I love this. Let's All right, so now we have Ansible up and running. Uh, it's bare bones, we need to set it up. Uh, we've got Proxmox hosts configured. We've got five of them working inside of a data center so I can manage them all from a single pane of glass. Where I'm going with this is that we're gonna be using Ansible to automate our virtual machine, to uh, basically automate our, our VM infrastructure as well as manage our, our firewall configurations once we deploy them on these guys. Um, I'm wondering with the Proxmox Ansible modules, am I able to talk to a single host within this cluster and the API push it to the appropriate dedicated host, right? So can I talk to, let's say PBE01 as my target for the Ansible module and have it push the workload or the task down to the appropriate hypervisor if I have to specify that. We'll see. We'll get to that point here soon. All right. I'm happy with my Proxmox environment. I I feel like I need to uh, take an opportunity uh, to, to install the additional USB network adapters so I can do an L2 trunk. But let's get up and running with Ansible now that we've got uh, this stuff. So... Again, this cheat sheet guide uh, gives you some idea on on the order of operation that I like to to uh, to work with. So uh, the very first thing is let's see, clear the dog. Hey Pete, uh, <laughs> thanks for joining, buddy. Um, uh, bots, bots, bots. Okay. Um, very first thing that I do. Let's go ahead and set up some RBAC in here. I'm going to create a, a new organization. For Ansible, um, leave off description, leave off execution environment. Okay, create a new org. And then I'm going to start stuffing some users in this org. I'm going to create a user for me. And my username will be that. And my password will be this. And I will confirm that. And I will have King Kong access. But I will be a part of the Redtail organization. Now I also want to create an automation uh, service account so that we can just talk to the API of Ansible Tower and not or AWX and not have to uh, log in with our stuff. So let's go ahead and create a uh, 
automation user here. Automation, um, my password will be Palo Alto, exclamation point, number one. We're all friends here, please don't hack me. We're cool, right? Uh, this will also be a system admin, just because I don't want to run into permissions issues right out of the gate. Everyone, <laughs> it's like Oprah, right? <laughs> you want super user, you got super user. You're a super user, you are. Uh, let's create our first uh, RBAC uh, permission controlled user. I'm gonna create knock one. And knock one is my username and same password, Palo Alto. A new user is going to be a part of Redtail. And let's create a, um, a new team here. I'm going to call this my security operations team. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The organization is Redtail. And let's add in our knock user one. So, let, oh, let's first control the roles that I can have. Uh, ch -ch 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 roles. This person can look at job templates. Uh, they can, um, let's see, they can see the demo. That's fine. And they can execute it and they can read the status, but they cannot administrate it. Okay, good to go. Let's add a user now to my team. Uh, let's access, add the user of knock one. There we go. So knock one is gonna have uh, really limited uh, permissions in comparison to my other users. Uh, okay, so they can read certain things. Uh, they can execute playbooks, but they cannot administrate them. They can't delete them. They can't edit them. It's a lab, bro, <laughs> and immediately in production. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome to the way that my brain works. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Good stuff. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. All right. So uh, I got an organization. I got three members, one team. Uh, okay. So we're, we're good with that. Uh, oh, hilarious stuff. All right. Uh, credentials. This is the, the next part where I really want to spend some time at. Uh, we're going to have multiple credentials here. I need a credential that's going to be able to log into my firewalls. I need a credential that's going to be able to log into my network switches and routers. I need a network, uh, I need a login credential that's gonna be able to administrate my Linux servers. I need a credential that's gonna be able to administrate my Proxmox environment. I'm gonna need a credential that's gonna be able to authenticate with GitHub and pull down a uh, private repository. So we're gonna need a lot of credentials, man. This is, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the fact of life. Let's start with the easy ones first. In our last stream that we did last week, we did uh, we set up this workstation. We set up things like WSL2, uh, which allows you to run Linux on your computer. Uh, in that setup guide, we had created an SSH key pair and uploaded the public key to GitHub. And then we were able to pull down private repositories to our local machine. I wanna use that same key pair. No, I don't, I don't. That's not That's not the way that we do this, right? This is my production lab environment. We're going to do things semi appropriately. We'll create a separate key pair with SSH. We'll upload the public to my GitHub and then we'll add the private key to AWX. And then AWX will be able to authenticate to uh, pull down private repositories. All right. So um, remember this key, this, um, this, this is one of like the only commands in the world that works on Windows, Linux, Mac, Unix, uh, almost anything out there, the generation of key pairs. So SSH key gen, uh, the type is gonna be RSA, the bytes is gonna be 4096, and a comment is going to be, we'll say AWX. It's gonna ask us where we want the key pair installed. And I'm going to change this, I'm gonna say users, a user dot ssh this is one of the things that drives me crazy about windows it's like it's a <laughs> the path is a combination of uh backslashes and forward slashes come on microsoft you gotta get it together guys uh no password for that uh it didn't like the key name what did i do wrong i don't think i did anything wrong i think i was in the right here ah path was wrong let's try that again 
I typed in a users users when it should have been just user users user dot ssh uh, awx. Okay. Uh, you know what? We're just gonna skip Windows. We're gonna jump into Ubuntu on the host. Let's 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 just not even dilly dally with this. Okay. SSH keygen type is RSA. Uh, the bytes is forty ninety six, and the comment is gonna be AWX. And home slash pan office hours. SSH AWX. Boom. All right. Let's open that up. Uh, SSH AWX.pub. This is going to be my public key. This is fine to share with the World Wide Web. Uh, best practice probably wouldn't be to do so, but we're all good. So let's go into my GitHub account settings and look at SSH and GPG keys. We're going to add a new SSH key. We're going to call this AWX. Paste the public side, not the private, the public side. Add this, uh, authenticate, and let's test this SSH key. Uh, we'll say SSH T. I forgot what T meant. It's kind of some kind of test. It doesn't stand for test, but it, it stands for something along those lines. I'm going to point to my identity file, which is going to be my AWX. I don't want it to use my system's default, so I have to tell it, hey, use this one instead. Uh, and then we're going to say git at github.com. Now, what I'm expecting back is a hello message from GitHub that says, we've successfully authenticated your user pan office hours, but we do not offer uh, shell access to GitHub. <laughs> uh, let's give this a shot. Uh, yeah, that's what we got. So hi, pan office hours, you successfully authenticated. GitHub does not provide shell access. This is just a really quick and dirty way of validating that your, uh, your key pair, the private key on your local machine and the public key that was posted into your GitHub account, uh, they are working uh, successfully. So come back over to AWX now. Let's create a new credential. Uh, this is going to be GitHub source control. And uh, organization is going to be in Redtail. And credential type is going to be source control. There's all kinds of goodies. Uh, we'll probably just use three of these at most. We'll use source control to authenticate to GitHub or Visual Studio Code. Uh, Microsoft's, um, what do they call it? Uh, Azure DevOps. I forgot what they call it. Um, anyway, source control. That's what we're doing right now. Network to log into network devices and machine to log into like our Linux host and such. I feel like we will be using the machine or something else, maybe an API token to talk to Proxmox, but we'll get to that soon. Oh, I will also be using a container registry credential because um, Ansible AWX, it uses containers that they call execution environments to do all the heavy lifting. Uh, this allows us to get third-party Python packages into AWX without having to manually load them, which used to be our way of getting Python packages. So like in the instance of a Palo Alto firewall, we have a Python SDK, uh, which basically just maps out all of the API functionality in, in a Python format. And then our Ansible modules use that SDK. So if I want to automate a Palo Alto Networks firewall, I need to have that SDK or else the Ansible modules will be broken. They won't know how to, to do the thing. And the old way that we used to do this with AWX is we would like log in. It was so ugly. Ugh. AWX was running as containers in Docker Compose. We would have to shell into the container. And then there were multiple Python virtual environments inside the container. And we would have to install the packages in those right virtual environments. And we had to do that for multiple containers. It was terrible. It was a terrible, terrible experience. Execution environments get us away from that. So we'll be using those. All right. Uh, source control. Uh, I don't think I need to actually use a username. Uh, the, the key pair is your identity itself. So what I need to do is under SCM private key, I either need to type out my private key verbatim 
or point to a the directory where my file is. So here's the funny thing. We've got, we're actually, we generated that key pair in Ubuntu, which is running as WSL2 here in, in Windows. I need to find a way of getting to the WSL2 file directory. I think it's that, but I might be wrong. Let me see. I, I think I've got it mapped on my actual host machine here. Ubuntu. It's, um, let's do this. WSL.localhost slash Ubuntu. Yeah, buddy. All right, so there's our Ubuntu file system. Uh, looking in the home directory, pan office hours for a hidden directory called SSH, and there it is. There's my private key. Remember, kids, <laughs> we upload the public key to GitHub. The private key stays on the client, which in this case is AWX. So let's click open. Uh, there's the whole private key. It should look like this, with this being the very first line. Uh, let's go ahead and click save. And let's test this out. I've got a um, a playbook somewhere in here that is private. And we'll try to, yeah, here we go. My first Python project, sure. This is a private repository, meaning you can't see it. Uh, only my user can see it. Uh, so when we try to clone this into AWX, this will be the way to validating that the SSH key pair is working. Uh, so we're gonna uh, click the green button under SSH. We're gonna copy the repository. And back into AWX now, let's go to projects. So <clears throat> Ansible AWX, I love it. I talk, uh, I talk about it all the time. And some of that is criticism. Here's one of my first criticisms. The words that they use in AWX don't have a one-to-one -one mapping into the other uh, domains. Specifically, when you hear the word project, I want you to think repository, right? Yes, you can technically create a repository um, outside of Git, right? You can use some of these others. Manual, you should never ever do. It should always be a Git-based repository. But just think when you say, when you hear project, think repository. We're gonna call this uh, my first Python project and no description uh, associated to my organization. Don't need to use an execution environment for this. Uh, I'm going to, the source code URL is what we copied from the GitHub project. I'm not gonna specify a branch. I do need to specify a source control credential. Well, let me show you what it looks like if we don't. I'm gonna click save. And I'm gonna to try to clone this repository. But since I did not associate this repo, this project to my source control, it's gonna fail. And if we click into this, it's gonna say, hey, uh, could not, re this is the line right here. Could not read from the remote repository. Please make sure you have the correct access rights which is exactly right. So let's go back to our project. Excuse me. Let's edit it and let's tell it to use a source control credential. The only uh, credentials that will show up here are the source control ones. So if your network credentials and blah, 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 they're not gonna be here, just your source control. Let's select it and click this save button that we got going on. And let's try that sync process yet again. What we should see now is that error goes away and we should get a nice little green Thumbs up telling us that we're good to go. Let's see here. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so now I have successfully cloned this project. Now, spoiler alert, this is not a, this is not an Ansible playbook inside of here. Uh, this was just a, 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 a pseudo project that I created just so that we could test our credentials. We will be creating Ansible projects here to automate our firewalls and our Proxmox environment, but I need to make sure that credentials are solid before we go down that route. All right, I knocked on Red Hat just a little bit for saying, uh, calling them projects, I get it, um, but just you have to make that mental map as to this is a repository. You have to do the same when you look at templates. Templates uh, are not what you think of as templates in the Ansible world. In the Ansible world, when you hear a template, you think like, hey, there's a Jinja file. We're running these values through this template and we're getting some kind of output. That's not what's happening here. Uh, what's happening here is a template is effectively an Ansible 
playbook. So really confusing. Uh, but whenever you whenever you are logged into AWX and you click on templates, think Ansible uh, Ansible playbook. These are the actual things that uh, we will be executing. Yes, I totally understand why they call them templates because uh, it, it uh, but it's confusing. So don't let that be the thing that that really trips you up. Uh, okay, so now we've got templates working. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got our, our source control. We got our back. I think we're ready to start actually building some automation here. I think we're good to go. Um, let's start off by creating a new repository in GitHub. So I'm gonna come up to this plus arrow and say new repository. And we're gonna say, this is an Ansible playbook to uh, provision a firewall, All right? So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to build an Ansible playbook that's gonna automate some configuration on our firewall. Uh, automate firewall config on pan OS. All right, uh, let's make this private. No, let's make it public just in case you guys wanna hang out and, and check it out yourselves. Um, in order to initialize this project, you need to um, first add a readme file. This will just be a blank uh, documentation file. Uh, something to add to the git ignore. When I'm working in Ansible, I always select Python. Uh, this isn't a necessity. You could skip the git ignore in totally. But the git ignore file is what we use to kind of signal which files that we don't want backed up. Uh, and so they provide you some templates here. Uh, Python will prevent all like the Python compiled files and those things from being included. Uh, the license, let's go ahead and just select Apache 2.0. That's nice, good enough, and create that repo. All right, so there we go. Got our first Ansible project available. Let's go ahead and grab the URL over SSH. And we're gonna clone this into Visual Studio Code where we're gonna actually build some automation. Now, if you remember in the last session here, I, I went through a lot of different Visual Studio Code plugins. One of them was to color the window so that I can quickly tell which uh, project is doing which. Uh, let's go ahead and exit out of this directory. I'm gonna create a new directory in my home directory. Again, I'm on Windows but I'm using WSL2 uh, to give me Linux, give me a, a, a full native Ubuntu Linux ex, uh, experience. So I'm actually inside of that Linux instance right now, and I'm in my home directory, uh, and I'm gonna create a new directory called dev. And this is where I'm gonna do all of my development for. I'm gonna change into the dev directory, and we're gonna clone our first project that we had just created in GitHub. And then I'm going to open that project by using the word code and then pointing to the name of my directory. And that's gonna open up a new instance of Visual Studio Code. And again, uh, as we saw last time, we're gonna get a, a prompt that's gonna say, do you trust the authors of the files in this directory? I'm gonna say, yes, we do, that's me. You can disable those alert, uh, alerts, by the way, uh, it's up to you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna open up my terminal on the bottom. Uh, again, the control tilde will open and close your terminal, give you new access to the Linux shell, or you can come up to the top and say toggle panel. That works as well. Or you can access the, uh, the what do they call it? The command palette, which is kind of like a uh, search for everything inside of Visual Studio Code. You can use control shift P for that. And you should be able to say terminal no uh, shell. No, I don't know how to open the shell through uh, the terminal. All right, anyway, no worries. Uh, here's something that I don't like. I, I'm using a Z shell for my Linux shell and I've got some customization on there. One of those things requires like a certain font. I can see right now inside of my terminal, Visual Studio Code doesn't know to select that font. So it's uh, rendering one of these things as a question mark. Let's uh, hold down control and comma and then do a search here for font. And I want to change the font. I want to add the font family that supports uh, the thing that I'm looking for. And I forgot what name of the font that it is. Let me just look at font settings. We had installed this last time we were here. Uh, 
It is Droid Sans Mono for Powerline. This is what I'm looking for. Uh, so, I Windows, you won't let me copy the name. So we're going to have to type this out manually. All right, so put this in quotes. I'm going to say Droid Sans Mono Powerline. That's a question mark. Uh, Droid... Droid Sans Mono or Powerline. All right, there we go. That should do it. Let me click save. Yeah, there we go. So our icons are now appropriate. This is important to me. I, I, I know it's a cosmetic thing, but honestly, like Z Shell, it gives you some really good insights on the current status of your project through these like external fonts. So let's say um, if I was to, let's create a new file. I'm gonna say, uh, playbook.yaml and I'm, if I hit the save button, my shell should now report that there's been a file that's something has changed right within Git. Let me close this out for a second. So my shell is telling me right off the bat, hey, there's something that's different, right? We didn't get the exclamation point up here, but we got it when we created a new file. And it gives me a little clue to say, hey, get status. And then I can see that there's an untracked file called playbook.yaml. Let's go ahead and add that through the command line. I'll be using Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code to do these operations, but for now we'll just use command line. Uh, if I add that now, uh, I've added that file to now be included. And let's do git push. The first time I do a git push, I, oh, I sh thought I was gonna get uh, an error, but looks like we're good to go. Now, if I come back here and refresh my page, I should have, uh, is it just because it's empty? It didn't commit. Oh, I didn't commit it. That's why. Git commit, and we're gonna say add empty playbook file. So I'm adding a message to my commit operation. So the exclamation point goes away. If I do git status, it's gonna say, all right, you're good to go, go ahead. You are one commit ahead of the remote. In this case, the remote is GitHub. So now we're gonna do git push and we should get a message here. No, it doesn't. All right. Sometimes you might get a message from the prompt to say that you need to specify what branch that you're pushing to remote origin, main, blah, blah, blah. Um, just follow the, the, the output and you should be okay. If I refresh this page now, I should have a playbook.yaml it was just committed uh, and here's my commit message and it should be empty and it is cool beans. All right, so let's do this. Let's copy some of my my work. Uh, let's go to C.65 and look at the users. There's me and let's copy some of my examples, uh, pan Ansible examples. Let me pull down this, uh, let's look in Ansible. Uh, which one do we wanna do? Let's do, uh, let's do a, a, a pull operation. So what we're gonna do, no, let's actually create something. Let's create some policy. Uh, let's create a security object in Panorama. All right, here's my playbook. Here's my inventory file. Here's my Ansible config. And here's my group vars. All right, let's talk about these really quick. The playbook itself, it doesn't have to be called playbook.yaml, by the way. I just did it because that's easy for newcomers to know what, what does what in this directory. Playbook.yaml is going to be my playbook where I actually have the tasks and tell it, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. This will be the thing that we actually execute from our Ansible um, AWX. Inventory.yaml. This matters only when you're executing Ansible locally. In the case of, in our case, we're going to be using Ansible Tower. There's a dedicated section for inventory. So this, this file, this inventory file is not going to provide us a whole lot of value except outside of local testing. Ansible config, this is a really important file. Uh, this basically tells Ansible how to do, uh, how to override some of the defaults of Ansible. You're going to, you're going to know this Ansible config file if you're interfacing with network devices because Ansible was built to automate servers. We kind of commandeered it to start doing networking stuff like firewalls, routers, and switches, and access points. 
So there are some default behaviors of Ansible that we have to override, and that's where the Ansible config file goes. And the last thing here, I have a directory called group vars all. These are group variables that anything under the all group will inherit these variables. We'll take a look at them just in a second. All right, this is my actual playbook. Let's uh, kind of walk through this really quick um, by actually, let me copy this and we'll do it in Visual Studio Code. All right, so my playbook.yaml and blah, blah, blah. All right, so let's talk through this to explain kind of what's going on here. My playbook is going to do this. It's going to look at the host called Panorama. So I'm gonna be automating my firewall management server. I could go directly to the firewall if I wanted to, but in this case, it looks like I'm gonna be going to Panorama. Connection local, if you've never used Ansible before, this is something that you need to know about if you're doing network things. The default behavior, again, Ansible was built to automate servers. The default behavior of Ansible is that it's gonna, uh, whenever you execute a playbook, it'll look at all the things that you've got listed under tasks. And I've got a task here and I've got a task here. What Ansible does is it creates a Python file and it remote copies it to the remote server and then executes that Python uh, uh, task and then reports back to the Ansible controller what the result of that task was. This works great for servers. It allows us to effectively delegate the heavy lifting to the remote device itself. The caveat is that that remote host has to have Python installed. For us in the networking world, that's not a luxury that we have, right? So what we need to do is we need to tell Ansible, hey, do not try to take this task, write a Python file and push it to the remote device to execute. Actually execute it here on your local server. So that's what connection local means. You're gonna be using connection local when, you're, when the remote device doesn't have Python available for you. Uh, similar is gather facts. This is kind of like a, like in the networking world, we would call this like a show version or a show system info. The idea is that the default behavior of Ansible, when it logs into the remote device, it wants to get all the information about that server. It gets things like its IP address, its host, uh, host name, the version of operating system it's running, the kernel version, blah, blah, blah. That's great for servers. It doesn't work for us networking nerds. So gather facts, we have it set to false. This one become equals false. This is optional. This is basically saying like, um, uh, do not ask for super user privileges on the remote host. In our case, we're not connecting to remote host. So this is actually optional. I'm gonna remove this. All right, now for the import function. I want to import the Palo Alto Networks Ansible collection into my project because we're gonna be doing Palo Alto networks configuration manipulation. I need those modules available. So there's an import function that needs to take place. And that's what we're looking at right here in this line. Ansible.utils, this is helpful if there's a certain Ansible pre-built functionality that you want to, uh, to extend into your playbook. I use Ansible utils a lot when I'm trying to convert like XML config into something like a Python dictionary. Um, there's a, and there's a lot of other utilities that Ansible provides, not necessary for us. We'll go ahead and remove it. Let's look at the actual tasks themselves. I'm getting an error. We'll address that just in a second. Uh, this is the Ansible task. It looks like it's saying validate that panorama would allow us to create an object running in check mode. So what this playbook actually does is it logs into panorama. Uh, based on my uh, Panorama username and my API token. And it checks to see if Panorama would allow me to create this address object. It doesn't actually create it itself. That's what this check mode equals yes. If I wanted to actually create the object, I would either delete that or I would comment it out. Uh, either one, either approach works, but I'm just validating that Panorama will allow me to create the object. This is effectively just my like poor man's way of just testing my API key, testing my panorama URL, 
uh, testing the the structure of the playbook. I'm not actually making a change, but I'm I'm almost making a change. This is also a really good way to get uh, get your feet wet with Ansible. If you're looking at uh, how do I get familiar with this workflow, how do I build modules, it can be really intimidating, especially when you have the opportunity to break production config. So check mode equals yes is a really great thing to have. This is the actual Ansible module that we are importing up here from this collection. So we have a module called PanOS address object. I need to pass it a uh, all the information that Ansible needs to know how to connect to my remote device. In the Ansible world, we call that a provider. Again, <laughs> one of those situations where I gotta say Ansible, is there was there a better phrase for this? But provider is basically where you store your username, password, and tell Ansible, here's how you connect to the remote device. Here's the actual things that this module will allow us to provision. It's gonna allow us to create an address object. It's gonna have the name of a gaming PC. We'll probably change that. The address object type will be an FQDN. This could be an IP wildcard. This could be an IP net mask. This could be, you know, there's all types of different address objects you can create on a firewall. This is gonna be the value of that FQDN in case it's gonna be gaming redtail.com and a description is PC. So that's the first task. The second task is just to, pr to print to the console the result of my first task. So not a whole lot going on there. All right, so I need to find a way of getting the provider information into my playbook. I do not want to hard code my username, my password, that type of information. That's a, it's a really bad uh, route that you can go down. So let me show you how we're gonna get data variables inserted right here. I need to create a, a variable called panorama username, and I need to create a variable called panorama API token. Ansible host is a predefined uh, variable name that references the entry within the inventory file. So if your inventory file is like a, a domain name or if it's an IP address, whatever it is, it's gonna be automatically available in our playbook as Ansible underscore host. So I don't, need to, I don't need to recreate this, but I do need to create these two. Let me show you why. If I try to execute this right now, a lot of things are gonna fail, first of all, uh, no, I, I it's going to block the kit because we don't have an inventory file. Let's create the inventory file first. Then I'll show you uh, what it looks like if the uh, API uh, things aren't created. So here's my inventory file. It is also in YAML. It's quite small, so it's easy to kind of pull apart. We'll create a new file here. We'll save this as inventory.yaml and hit save. All right. Here's my inventory file. I have a, a host named Panorama. Um, under the host, I'm sorry, I have a group called Panorama. And then under that group, I have entries of hosts. So if you have multiple Panorama instances, it would look like panorama1.redtail.com, panorama2, blah, 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 blah. You get the picture. In my case, I just have a single one. So we're going to run with that. Now, you'll note back in our playbook, when we talked about the host, it references this panorama word right here. This directly looks into our inventory and tries to find a group by that name. And if it can't find a group, it'll look for a host by that name. In my case, panorama is the name of a group that has a host called panorama.redtail.com. So that's where that is. I could have also use the all word because there's an all encompassing group at the top root. So I could have done this as well, and that would have worked. But in my case, I'll just be a little bit more specific here. Um, the last thing I need to do is build that inventory file. I'm sorry, the Ansible config file. Now this one is not YAML. It looks a little bit different. And some of the, the flags here aren't really intuitive. Let's call this ansible.cfg. It has to be called ansible.config, by the way. Has to, has to, has to, has to. And it's an INI format, so it looks a little bit differently. Like YAML is like a combination of um, nested, uh, white space indented with colons separating the key from the actual value itself. Uh, in this case, uh, we have groupings that are listed here in brackets 
and then we set the key value by entering like an equal sign equals this. Again, the Ansible config file is the file that lets us override some of the default behaviors of Ansible. Uh, these are some of those uh, that I usually have disabled for all of my projects. Uh, host key checking equals false. This will prevent a, uh, a, a prompt when you're first SSHing to a remote device for the first time. It'll ask you if you trust that SSH key pair that will break your automation because it'll be waiting for you to say yes or no. We don't want that. So I turn host key checking to false. Uh, host key auto add. This is just a nice little workaround to say, whenever you connect to a remote device for the first time, take that public key and automatically add it to your list of known devices. Uh, retry files enabled equals false. This will prevent uh, useless files from being created in your local directory. Forks. Let's, uh, I think this is probably going to be one of the last ones I talk about here. Forks is basically the way that we get multi-threading in Ansible. It's, that's not technically correct, but let's just say, for instance, uh, if this was set to one, uh, what would happen? Well, if I automate my playbook against a single device, I'll see no difference, right? Uh, there will be a single fork again ansible just using the weirdest words um it, it would it would take my task and it would execute it against that one device and then we would be done but if i had a hundred devices if forks was still set to one what the playbook would do is it would execute against the first device in your inventory and then once that's done it would execute against the second and then once that's done it's execute against the third etc cetera, etc cetera. This gives Ansible kind of a really bad reputation as being like really slow. Uh, it's not really a, an Ansible thing as much as it is a Python thing, but uh, you can think of forks as a way of saying, use these many threads to execute this task against these many devices at the same time. So if I have it set to 15 and I have a hundred hosts, when I get to a specific task, it's going to execute that against the first 15 devices. And as the responses start to come back, new forks or new threads will then be issued for those additional hosts, right? So it's it's saying how many tasks can be executed simultaneously, if that makes sense. Um, blah, blah, blah. This one, this is like the big stinky uh, problem with Ansible uh, is that sometimes... <laughs> Uh, and I mean, almost all of the time, Ansible has a really hard time of handling things like virtual environments. This is not going to be a problem for us when we use Ansible Tower, because we're going to be executing it in an execution environment. But if you've worked with Python before, you know, like one of the very first things you do in a project is you create a, a virtual environment, which is like a dedicated directory that has a dedicated instance of Python with all of your packages for that project. Ansible has a uh, is notorious for really struggling at detecting where those virtual environments are. So if you are executing this locally, and I, I feel like we're going to run into this problem when we do a debug here uh, local, if, if you're using virtual environments and Ansible saying, I don't know where this, I don't know where Ansible is. I don't know where the Python SDK is. I don't know this. I don't know that it's probably a problem with your Python interpreter and you're going to need to override it in your Ansible config file. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention, again, if you're executing locally, uh, you can add the inventory key value pair and you don't need, at this point, you would not need to pass the uh, the flag of an inventory file. All right, it's a lot of words. Let's see if I say, um, say which Ansible. It's going to tell me my, my Linux intro, uh, distro says, Ansible is not found, so we cannot execute it. Let's create a Python virtual environment and then execute, uh, install Ansible into that virtual environment and then test this playbook locally. And then you're going to see some of the problems that we'll run into. So we're going to create a, uh, a, a virtual environment with poetry and knit. Uh, if you're interested in this, we did a, a deep dive on poetry on our last session right here. Uh, the thing that I want you to just take away, this is creates the Python virtual environments for us, and it gives us the ability to install packages. So I'm going to say install Ansible, uh, and I want to select the uh, version zero, which is the direct match. 
uh, and I want to use the latest version. That's good. Uh, I also want to add the uh, Pan OS Python, which is the Python SDK for Pan OS. Uh, and that is listed right here at uh, list item zero. Uh, I will also use the latest version and that looks good to go. Uh, do not need to develop, uh, no developer dependencies. Uh, yes. All right. So that creates the instructions for creating our virtual environment. I now see that we have a new file here called pyproject.toml, which is effectively what we just created through poetry. Now I need to install or create the virtual environment with poetry install. This will look into this pyproject.toml file. It'll find all of our dependencies. In this case, that's Ansible and PanOS Python. It'll look to see if these dependencies have dependencies of their own, which they do. And it's going in and it's grabbing this information uh, and it's installing it. So Ansible, the current version of Ansible is 7.1 uh, and uh, PanOS was 1.8.0. You get this error message. Um, this is totally fine. This is just don't worry about it. We talked about it last time. Don't worry about it. It's what I'm going to say. Now I've created the virtual environment. I've installed Ansible inside of that virtual environment, as well as our Python SDK for PanOS. Now I need to activate. And that's the last step. And that's Poetry Shell. Now you can see if I clear my screen, my shell looks a little bit different and that I have got a new line at the top. This tells me, uh, Z shell is telling me that I am inside a Python virtual environment called Ansible Provision Firewall. It's running Python 3.10. And if I look at my Python packages with pip freeze, I can see that we've got Ansible installed as well as the PanOS Python uh, module. All right, this is not all that we need to do though. I still need to install the Ansible collections, but let's start showing you all the problems with what we've got and how we can fix them in just a couple of seconds. Uh, I want to tell VS Code to uh, to look for my Python interpreter. Um, uh, actually, I don't care about that. Let's just skip that for now. Let's just execute the playbook. So Ansible playbook, uh, playbook.yaml. We're gonna get a few errors and Ansible is really good at covering your screen with red text and making you feel like you broke the world. Uh, what does it say? It says it could not resolve the module PanOS address object. It either indicates a misspelling, a missing collection, or incorrect module path. In this case, what it's telling us is like, hey, look, you're importing the Pano Palo Alto Networks.PanOS Ansible collection, you know, to do your actual heavy lifting, but you actually haven't installed it yet. Uh, it's looking, let's look at this, Ansible dash dash version. It's looking in all these locations for your modules and your collections. So for modules, it's looking here. For the Ansible collection, it's looking here. Uh, and it's saying that you don't have it installed. And that's because we have not installed this yet. So to install this, let's use our friend Google and say Ansible collection, Palo Alto networks. And let's click on this link. And this is, these are the droids that we're looking for right here, this command. This will install the Ansible collection on our local machine. This will get us past the first error. So Ansible dash collection, which is, think of Ansible Galaxy as like um, apt or apt package manager or yum or um, what, what do they call the new one on rel? It's dandified. Uh, it's, it's something. Yeah. DNF, uh, I forgot its name. Anyway, uh, think of Ansible galaxy as like the Ansible version of that. We're saying, Hey, I want you to go down to the Ansible collect, uh, Ansible galaxy website, grab a collection called Palo Alto networks .pan OS and install it. And that will do our bidding for us. All right, so it's downloaded it. It successfully installed it, this version to this specific directory. Let's go ahead and clear our screen and try to execute our playbook again. We're still gonna have a problem. We'll talk about that problem just in a second. All right, so the error message is a little bit different. It's also a red wall of text, but it is a little bit different. 
Uh, it's saying this task includes an option with an undefined variable. The error was panorama underscore username is undefined. And that is true. Now we have a couple of options here. I could hit the up arrow and I could pass in the dash E and then define that variable right here. So I could say panorama underscore username equals pan office hours. That's gonna get past the, uh, that basically allows me to create a variable at runtime and set a value for it to get inserted into the playbook. But we got a very similar error that comes back and says, all right, now you forgot to pass in your API token. It's undefined. And that's true. Uh, I do not have it defined. So uh, rather than uh, passing in another variable at the runtime, we have a couple of options here inside of our playbook. Let's close this out for now. Again, I could have hard coded my username right here, like uh, pan office hours. That's a, hey, that solves the problem kind of, right? But my API token, oh heavens, like I, I don't want the API token to ever be hard coded in a text file, especially when the playbook is managed inside of GitHub because then the entire world is gonna be able to see this. So this is a problem for us. All right. Uh, so I don't want it hard coded here. I have an option of creating what's called a group variables folder where I can stuff all of my sense, uh, all of my variables into. So let's do that. Let's create a uh, directory called group underscore vars. And let's create another group inside of there for uh, panorama, which is the name of my group here. Uh, and if I type in tree, oh, I need that sudo apt install tree dash y. Uh, I think this is my right password. Yeah, okay. Tree is just a, a, a friendly way of getting like a, a folder directory outputted in your console. So if I type tree, I can see that we've now got a new directory called group vars. Uh, there's a nested folder in there called panorama. Uh, now let's create a file in this directory where we can store our variables in. So I'm going to say code group vars panorama. Uh, we'll just call this um, auth.yaml. That opens up a new file here for us to start dumping some stuff in. The first thing I want to do is uh, what's the first variable name? It's panorama underscore username. So panorama underscore username is going to be set to and office hours. And I need to also create one for my Panorama API token. So Panorama API token, and I'm gonna leave this blank. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap these in double quotes just in case. Ansible does a really good job, by the way, of, of uh, determining what type of data it's looking at. So like, for instance, if I set this to uh, the number 10, Ansible would recognize this as an integer. Uh, or if I wrapped it in quotes, it would recognize it as a string. Uh, so there is interpretation on the data type that can come through. Uh, what I like to do sometimes is just hard code all my strings in quotes so that I don't ever confuse Ansible. Uh, it's just, it's, hey, this is a string. This will always be a string. All right, uh, the Panorama API token. We need to generate an API token for my firewall. Uh, so the way that I'm going to do this is I'm just going to, let's do curl for this. I'm going to create a, a curl command that's going to generate an API token for me. And we'll stuff the output inside of here. Yes, you guys will see my API token. Uh, I'll be okay with that. So I'm going to make a curl request. By the way, this is all documented on the website of how to create an API token. But I'm basically saying, uh, talk to my Panorama instance, talk to its API. I want to generate a, an API key gen. Uh, my user is gonna be pan office hours and my password is Palo Alto one exclamation point. When I hit that, uh, let's see, I think I'm gonna get a, yeah. Okay, so I got, I have one problem. I'm about to run into a second problem. We'll talk about it when we see it. The first one is DNS. My uh, my Windows machine or my WSL2 doesn't know to append this DNS suffix. So I need to do that. Now here's the second alert that tells me that my SSL certificate, my SSL is not, um, 
It's not uh, an authoritative SSL, it's a self-signed cert. So what we need to pass in as well is the letter K. And that's gonna return back with an API token for me, for my user. So we're just gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it right here and I'm gonna hit the save button. Now, when I execute this playbook, fingers crossed, everything should work. Let's try it. Ansible playbook, playbook.yaml. All right, so we got a failure. It says it's missing a library, pan Python. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, about the interpreter path in Ansible, like really struggling to find packages that are installed into a virtual environment. It's frustrating. Uh, there's not a lot of good documentation out there. Uh, when you run into this problem, your the error message might be a little bit different, and then you're gonna not know how to do your Google search appropriately. But I know for a fact that Ansible is mistakenly using my system's Python shell instead of my virtual environment. How do I know this? Because this tells me right now that Python or when Ansible executed, Ansible tried to use Python 3.8. And I know for a fact, in my virtual environment, I'm running Python 3.10. Let's test this. I'm in the virtual environment right here. If I type in Python dash dash version, I get Python 3.10.9. So what is Ansible doing trying to reach out to Python 3.8? What what's the deal? The problem is that again, uh, Ansible doesn't know how to find your virtual environment with all of your goodies inside of it. And so it's defaulting to the system. This will drive you bananas if you're trying to debug it. So here's what I like to do. I type in which Python, and it'll give me the path of the Python uh, within my virtual environment. It's a long string, so just go ahead and copy it. And then we need to come back into our Ansible config file and update interpreter dash Python. Boom. There is another way around this, by the way, you can set a variable in your group bars that will fix this. Uh, but I would just want to show you the, the traditional way of doing this. Now that I've set, I've told Ansible exactly where I want my Python uh, to be uh, executed from. Let's go ahead and uh, run our playbook again. Ah, it looks a little bit different now, doesn't it? All right, so what we've done now is we've successfully issued our playbook. We got a thumbs up for this, and then we printed the results to the screen to say that if we were not running check mode, this would be the outcome. This is the difference. We would be creating an address object uh, called gaming-pc. Here is the value, and here's the description, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, let me, let me change something on here. Let's call this something different. Cause I actually already have this available on that, uh, on my panorama instance today. Let's call this, uh, Twitch, uh, live stream. And I want this to be a value is twitch at redtail.com. And the description will be, uh, live stream host. All right. Uh, let's issue this again. I'm also, I'm going to get a success, but it's going to look a little bit different. Before, this had not said change. This had said OK. And the reason why it did is because this had already existed. The previous object, gaming-pc, already existed. Uh, but this one, it says, no, uh, we would create this if we ran this right now. Uh, so let's go ahead and test this. Let's log into my Panorama instance here. Panorama... HTTPS, oh, and I, redtail.com. So, so yes, there is a script for that, but each new version breaks it. Okay, yeah, we already talked about that. Uh, let's log in here. Pan office hours and Palo Alto one exclamation point, I think. That might be wrong. No, it's good. All right, if I look at my address objects now, in device, address objects, we saw that gaming PC, yes, this was already there. 
Uh, let's run our playbook again and take off the check mode. So check mode, I'm gonna comment it out and we're gonna run this back. And now when I come over to here and refresh, first of all, I didn't refresh, but the commit button just lit up. So I know something's changed. Let me refresh the page and I can see Twitch live stream has now been added. This was added through Ansible. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and revert that, but very cool. All right, so now that we've got Ansible working with a playbook, let's go ahead and upload uh, our changes back to our GitHub repository and then add it to our Ansible AWX so that we can start automating it from the GUI. Before I do that, let's talk about the secrets, right? We know that we created a file here called auth.yaml and we know that it's got the keys to my kingdom right here. It's got the username and my API token. If you think that I want this on my public GitHub, you're sorely mistaken. Uh, I do not want people to be able to see this. Uh, where is uh, my local project here? So what I need to do is I need to encrypt my file that has my secrets on it. Um, let's refresh this. This is my GitHub project that we're about to push our changes to. It's got just the basic files that we had created. Uh, doesn't have my playbook, doesn't have group bars, none of that goodies. We still need to upload this. Um, but before I do, I need to encrypt my uh, auth file. So Ansible provides a mechanism for this. Uh, this is one of the really great things that it, it, it's a strength over other products like Terraform. Terraform, your, your secrets are still managed in Terraform state as clear text. So yeah, it's, it's kind of ugly. Um, so what we need to do is we need to encrypt this. Let's do Ansible dash vault, encrypt, group vars, panorama, and then auth.yaml. And it's gonna ask me for a vault password. I'm gonna give it a simple password here. And what do you see what happens? The file actually is now AES, AES 256 encrypted. If I execute this playbook again, it's gonna fail. It's gonna fail because it has no idea how to decrypt that secrets file. So if, I want, if I'm executing this locally, I need to now say ask vault pass. That needs to be uh, added as a flag. And then I will now be prompted for my password. And there we go. Now, obviously, being prompted for a password is problematic in like an automation setting because like you probably want some of these things to like happen without human intervention. There are mechanisms of getting a uh, Ansible decrypt uh, file on your local machine that can automatically do this at runtime. Uh, we're not going to focus on that because again, we're going to be working within, uh, AWX. So what I need to do now, now that I feel safe about this, uh, being on the public internet, let's review our changes. Looks here like we're creating an Ansible config file. Uh, here we're creating an Ansible inventory. These are all the things that are different, by the way. Uh, we get green and red for things that have changed. looks like we're creating a bunch of files. So I'm going to add a message and we're going to say, uh, initial pass at our playbook. I'm going to commit those changes. I'm going to say, yes, always do this and go ahead and synchronize to GitHub. So this is, uh, effectively doing like the Git commands that we were from the command line, like Git add, Git commit, Git push, those types of things. Um, uh, those are now going to be, uh, handled through like visual studio code. So we don't have to memorize those commands. Uh, coming back over into our GitHub project. If I refresh my page now, I can see that we've got um, our, our new files that have been added. I can see our commit message. I can see when they were added. I can also go back in time to look at all the changes that have taken place inside of this project. I can see what was added, what was deleted. Again, complete audit paper trail. One of the things that makes automation really nice. All right, so we've got our playbook. I need to add this into our Ansible AWS. Oh, let's look at our panorama. Let's just make sure that my keys weren't in there. If I look in auth.yaml, yes, 
the the file is still AES256 encrypted with my password. So you guys can't figure it out. Oh yeah. All right. Let's add this project into get uh, into AWX and execute it from the GUI. Uh, so we're going to copy this. Make sure SSH is selected. Copy that. Back in AWX, let's log in. I'm going to log in now with a username instead of the admin because I don't remember the admin password. And go to projects. We're going to add a new project and we're going to call this uh, Ansible. What do we call this? What's the name of this? It's uh, Ansible Provision Firewall. Sure, that's fine. Uh, the organization is Redtail. Uh, the description is use Ansible to provision a uh, NOS firewall. Execution environment. This is going to be something that we'll need to visit very, very soon. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and change the source control type to Git. Uh, let's paste in our Git URL right here. <laughs> Just kidding. Come back over here, grab that guy, and then paste it into here. Uh, branches, uh, we're not going to mess with branches. Source control, you already know we need to pass in our GitHub credentials. We have some options here that are worth mentioning. Uh, I like to add an update revision at launch, and that's, uh, that's good enough. What this basically says is every time the playbook is launched, go ahead and ask GitHub for the latest copy of the project. And then there's a cache timeout value. So maybe you set it to like two minutes or you set it to like three weeks or whatever makes sense for you. In my case, I just want it to always update from GitHub. It does make the process a little bit slower because it has to do a pull operation every time from GitHub. But I just like to always have a nice blanket of comfort knowing that I'm working from the latest version of this project. All right, so we've cloned the project, we're successful. Now we need to add the playbook. If you remember, that's under the templates uh, tab here. So let's click on templates. Let's add a new template and add new job template. And uh, let's say this will create an address object. Uh, that will be the name of my uh, playbook or template. Uh, inventory, we're going to have to touch on this really quick. You know that we, we created inventory when we did local files, but we're going to have to create an inventory inside of AWX as well. For now, since this is required, I'm going to just say demo inventory, and then we'll update that here pretty soon. The project, this is asking me which GitHub repo. So I'm going to click on this and say Ansible provision firewall. Execution environment, we'll have to visit this really quickly as well. Uh, we'll do that very soon. Uh, now the playbook, we're going to get a drop down menu of all the YAML files inside of our repository uh, or project. In my case, I want to uh, look at the playbook.yaml because that's our actual playbook here. Uh, credentials, I need to pass in a vault password to unlock that vault file so that the API token and the username are accessible in my playbook. I'm not going to enter anything now, just so that we can look at what the error looks like. Uh, forks, we already talked about forks. All this other stuff is fine. We'll go ahead and hit save. All right, so the very first thing I need to do before I launch this is I need to create a new inventory file that kind of looks like our inventory file uh, that we did for our playbook. Let's go to inventories in AWX. Create add, say add an inventory. We're going to call this our uh, panorama uh, inventory. It can be called anything. It can be called ice cream sundae. It will work. Uh, description, I'm too lazy to do one. So organization, make sure it's associated to the right org. Uh, and then click save. Now you've created the inventory. You need to add things into it. I will create a, uh, a host in this case, and I'll call it uh, panorama. And uh, I will hard code the value of Ansible host to be panorama.redtail.com. The reason I'm doing this is that I don't trust DNS resolution inside of my Kubernetes environment, which is where AWX is running. I don't trust it to automatically append 
the correct domain name, which would result in a failure for my job. Uh, so, okay, let's look back in our inventory. We have an inventory called Panorama Inventory. We don't have any groups, but I do have a host in here called Panorama, and Panorama is hard-coded to panorama.redtail.com. This could have been an IP address as well. It doesn't have to be a DNS. All right, let's go back to our template now and update it to use the appropriate inventory. By clicking on inventory, I'm gonna change it into panorama inventory. And you would think right now we've got every, well, we we're missing two things, but we're really close. Let's go ahead and click save. The two things that we still need to add is I need to tell it how to decrypt that encoded or that encrypted file that has my API tokens and stuff. Uh, so I need to tell it how to decrypt that. Let's move over to credentials. I'm gonna create a new type of credential. I'm gonna call this my Panorama Vault, uh, associate to the right org. And the credential type is going to be a vault. This is a, uh, again, just like what we did from the command line, uh, I just need to give it a password to uh, unencrypt the vault. I could also say, don't add a password, but every time you run the playbook that uses this vault, prompt the user for the password to encrypt it at runtime. Again, a couple of different ways to achieve the same goal, just makes sense, whatever makes sense for you. I'm gonna click save here, tell my password keeper to buzz off. Let's go back into our template and I need to tell it to use our, our new vault and that's done under the credentials. I'm gonna change the drop down menu to vault and then that's where we see the panorama vault listed. Go ahead and select that. Now, you would think we've got everything that we need to do to launch this, but it's gonna fail. And I'll show you why here just in a second. Let's click launch. And this is gonna go ahead, what it does, oh, we could probably catch this in the uh, lens. We'll, we'll check that out later. But what's gonna happen here is that uh, the Ansible playbook is gonna be sent to a dedicated container that's going to, called AWX task, and it's gonna go ahead and execute this uh, for us. So separate from the uh, UI container, it runs in a different container itself. The problem is, is that it's telling us is that it doesn't know how to resolve the module called PanOS address object. That's because there is no Python SDK or Ansible module available uh, for the Palo Alto networks right out of the box with AWX we need to create something that's called an execution environment that has all of our Python libraries, all of our Ansible collections, everything that's necessary for us to do this job. So uh, I told you earlier, this was a really hard way of doing this in previous iterations of AWX. It's much easier now. They have something that's called these execution environments. Let's go down to execution environment. And what an execution environment is, it's literally a Docker container image. That is 100% what it is. Ansible provides you with a tool called Ansible Builder that will enable you to build your own container images needed to do these execution environments. Now, in my case, I've already created one and there was a shortcut for it in that, uh, that cheat sheet that we were looking for earlier. Uh, where's the C.65? just GitHub, uh, yeah. And so uh, let's pick on this one. There is a, a container image that I already have built for this. Uh, so we just need to select, okay, here it is, down at execution environments. So I'm gonna create an execution environment called Palo Alto Networks. Let's do that now. And now I need to tell it what's the container image that has all the goodies installed in it. And that is available at this URL right here. I'm gonna to paste to that right here. Now I need to tell Ansible or AWX, like what's the default behavior? Whenever you run, whenever you're looking for this container, are you going to always can pull the container before running? Will you only pull the container if it's not present? on the AWX host or to never pull the container before running. In my case, I like to say always pull container for the similar project that I did, uh, for the similar reasons that I said it for my project, 
pulling from GitHub, I like to know that I'm working from the latest version of my container, just like I like to know I'm always working from the latest version of my GitHub project. Now, the way that containers work is that if it's already on your host machine and there have been no changes to that container, the, the pull process is like, it takes like half a second, right? Now, if there have been changes to the container image, then you need to pull those down. That takes a little bit longer. So this will be a one-time operation that will be probably like 30 seconds to pull down the container image, which will make our playbook seem like it's going a little slow. And every subsequent run, that operation will uh, be instantaneous. All right, uh, organization, again, associate it to Redtail. Click the Save button. Uh, the registry credential, if your uh, container image is hidden or hidden, if it's in a private repository, you will need to create a Docker uh, registry credential uh, for your container image and you would enter it here. Um, I hope that, I think that this one's a publicly available. Let's let's search this really quick, just to make sure. Uh, let's say, uh, Yeah, it looks like, yeah, this is a public image. Um, and I'm pulling from this tag called dev. All right, so uh, I don't need to enter a, a registry credential to use this, and neither do you, by the way. If you go through this tutorial, you stand up AWX and you get it all running, and you don't wanna build your own Palo Alto Networks container image, good good news for you. Um, you don't need to, It's it, I've, I've uh, made it publicly available. All right, click save and go back to the templates. We're gonna edit this and add in the execution environment of Palo Alto Networks. This will be our Docker container that's got our Ansible collections and our Python SDKs needed to do the job. Let's click select, save, and let's run this one more time. I have a good feeling that this is gonna work this time. Let's see. There's like 18 different things that could go wrong here. All right. So again, I told you that clone operation of pulling down the container image is a one-time thing. You're not gonna get any logs here. This is why I like to jump back into lens and say, look at Ansible EE, uh, or is it is it in here or is it in web? Uh, there is, no, I think it might be, I might be back like in EE. There's usually a good log message that will tell you that an execution environment is being pulled down. Why am I not seeing it? Uh, well, I'm not seeing it, but <laughs> if you have a problem and like this is uh, spinning, uh, let's, okay, we'll, we'll address this just in a second. Um, if, if this playbook, if you have an execution environment and it's selected, and you go to run your playbook and it's like, it gives you no output for like five minutes. You'll need to jump into your Kubernetes pod logs to see what the holdup is. All right. I got a package. One second, guys. All right. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, sign packages and stuff. All right. All right. Where are we at? Uh, okay. So this tells us that there's an undefined variable and its username, uh, panorama username. This makes me feel like it didn't respect our, our AWX credentials. Uh, or the, the vault that we had added, uh, because it says that the panorama username is undefined and we know it's in that file. So let's, uh, let's come back over to here. 
let's look at this a little bit closer uh, under templates, create address object. Let's edit this. It does have the vault here. That should have been enough. Uh, let's see. Let's come back to the vault. Let's re-enter my password just to make sure. It should have worked. Let's edit this vault type. I'm gonna refresh this password. You'll never be able to see uh, a vault password after you've entered it. Same with your passwords inside of AWX. It's going to, um, uh, uh, it's, it's always gonna have them hashed. So you'll always have to reset this. So we'll click that and we'll do that. And let's run this thing again. There's a couple of other ways, by the way, that you can address this. Uh, one would be you can create what's called a survey. And a survey is a way of saying like, when I execute this playbook, prompt the user for a username, prompt the user for a password. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Come on now, that is, it's here. I prom oh, I think I know what the problem is. All right, so this is the problem. We created a vault file called auth.yaml and it's got our username and password in it. We then took that file and stored it in a directory called group vars and then the name of a group called panorama. Now here's the problem back in AWX, when we created our inventory file, we did not create a group called panorama. So when Ansible is executing, it's looking to see, all right, I got a host. Uh, what are all of its local variables and what are all the variables that it's getting from group variables? This is a process that we call variable inheritance where you can basically map out variables at, at the group layer or you can do them at the host layer or you can do them at runtime. Now, the problem is that that Ansible says, all right, there's a there should be a group called Panorama and any device in that group is gonna inherit this auth.yaml. But again, back in our AWX inventory, we forgot, or we, we didn't forget, we just didn't create it, the group part. So let's create and go back to our inventory. Let's click into here. Let's now create a group. We'll call it Panorama, Panorama, and click save. Ah, here's the problem. It says a host with that name already exists. All right, so I'm kind of like, messing with myself here. Let's go back to the groups. I'm gonna rename this one panorama.redtail.com. It doesn't want you to have a group with the same name as the host, it confuses it. So I've renamed my host to panoramaredtail.com. It is not a part of any groups as you can see here. Let's now create a group called panorama. Let's see here, panorama. And now let's associate the host into this group by moving over into the host panel, clicking add and say, add an existing host and select panorama.redtail.com. There we go. Now, when we execute this, the group vars folder will now be associated to our panorama instance. And so that the vault file can decrypt the username and password or the username and API code token. There we go. Uh, okay, we got another problem here. Uh, no such file or directory. Ah, <laughs> boys, it's it's like it's it's one problem after the other. Uh, this is why you need a lot of perseverance when you're learning automation. You're gonna run into a lot of situations where you're presented with a wall of red text, and the message is not always gonna be like crystal clear what the problem is. Uh, and so you're gonna have to get really good with Google or even use chat GPT uh, to, to ask like, how do I uh, troubleshoot this? What's the problem? In this case, the problem is, is self-inflicted. Remember, we had created an Ansible config file, which told Ansible to look for the Python interpreter at a specific directory on our local machine. 
that file is now problematic because AWX is now looking for that Python interpreter. And it's like, hey, it does not exist inside of this container, which is absolutely correct. So what we'll do is we'll come back over into our Ansible config file. And I'm just gonna copy out, I'm gonna uh, comment out this line right here. And then we'll just say, uh, remove um, interpreter. Yeah, that's fine. I'll misspell it, that's okay. Uh, we'll sync that and then we'll finally execute it. And I'm gonna say, I'm about, uh, I'm 100% positive this is gonna work. And if it doesn't, uh, what's my stakes? If this doesn't work the next time, I will name my next pet. <laughs> uh, let's see, I've got 10 of them around here. Uh, my next pet will be named Susan. Heaven forbid. All right, so that's the stakes that we're operating at. But I'm really, I'm feeling pretty confident about this. Let's click the rocket ship here. I don't want a pet named Susan, so let's see. I'm like starting to sweat, beads of sweat as I'm nervous. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, so the, the problem is the same. It looks like my next pet is going to be named Susan. Uh, I kind of did this to myself. The problem is still back on the Ansible interpreter. So let me show you a different way of solving this problem of dealing with virtual environments and Python interpreters. Um, I, I want to say that like 10% of this is a Python problem. Right, just like the whole virtual environment thing is just a mess to deal with. Um, but uh, I would say 90% of it is Ansible's fault for not being able to, to really work with this. Guys, it's like Ansible's, it's on 7.1. You got to figure this out, guys. You got to get this figured out. All right, so let's go back to my uh, GitHub. GitHub, I can't believe my, my wife is going to not be very happy with me. Uh, let's go to my GitHub. I've got a, a, an example on how to address this back in my pan examples. Uh, let's look in Ansible directory. One of these is going to have the fix that I'm looking for. And I think it's going to be Ansible parameters. Yeah, this is it. So here's a really quick fix of dealing with problematic virtual environments either you're on awx or you're on local uh, machine it doesn't matter if you add this to your playbook this will fix all of your problems in life i'll prove it to you let's create a new file uh we'll call this fix ansible python version.yaml and I'm going to paste this in here. What this basically does is it, it says uh, allows us to override the Ansible Python interpreter and set it equal to a predefined valuable variable called Ansible underscore playbook underscore Python. This is effectively saying, Hey, wherever we execute Ansible from like whatever virtual machine, whatever is the Python engine that executes the Ansible command, use that as your Ansible Python interpreter. Yeah, I, I hate having to do it, but it's just, it's necessary. Uh, let's, oh, did I not add this? Um, fix Ansible garbanzo beans and commit and sync. By the way, if you work in a production environment with a team, don't add commit messages like me, right? I, I work by myself, so I can I can say whatever I want in my commit messages. But if you work in a team, try to be helpful. Use an actual valuable uh, commit message. Uh, back into here, if I refresh my page, I should see, yep, there's my commit message. So I feel like this is going to work. Oh, boy. Guys, if this doesn't work this time... Uh, I'll shave my head. That's going to be terrible. Uh, but I'm so confident. I feel so confident in myself. This is going to work this time, I promise you. 
I promise myself. Let's see. Please. I mean, I'm already balding, but I don't want to accelerate the process. Oh, I get to keep my hair. That's a benefit to both of us. Uh, you don't want to see my <laughs> the shape of my head. But all right. So, okay, good. We're, we're now able to execute our automation for our firewalls against our devices. This took a lot of things to, to figure out, right? We had to understand uh, execution environments. We had to protect our secret files uh, with, uh, with Ansible Vault. Uh, we had to do all kinds of things. It takes a lot to get this up and running. But once it's up and running, then we don't have to worry about it anymore. All right. So our Palo Alto firewalls, we're in a good position. We can now automate them through Ansible inside of the GUI. Let's start focusing on deploying some actual, uh, some virtual machines on our Proxmox environment. So I've never done this before, but we're going to go and look at Google first. And we're going to ask for Proxmox Ansible collection. Let's figure out how to use uh, Ansible with Proxmox. Let's see, Proxmox module. This is a community module, that's interesting. I don't know if these are the droids that we're really looking for. Let's scroll down here. Kind of pump this up just a little bit. Uh, create a new container with minimal options. Uh, this is, n is this a container or is this a VM? I know the word container is kind of thrown around a little haphazardly. If anyone knows if container means VM, because I'm, I'm kind of getting that vibe, right? This is a version of Ubuntu 14.4. Create a new container automatically. This might actually be a container container like a Docker container. Let's see if there's a, a one for a virtual machines. Uh, precision, quick and easy. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, where do we got here? Proxmox Vars, Pro oh my goodness. All right, no disrespect to the author, but that's kind of going all over the place. Where are the Proxmox for virtual machines? Management of KVM virtual machines and Proxmox VE cluster. All right, perfect. Allows you to create, delete, stop KVM virtual machines and a Proxmox VE cluster. Below requirements are needed on the host that executes this module. So we need a Python package called Proxmoxer we need a Python package called requests and we need these inside of Ansible AWX. So we're going to have to use uh, a execution environment to be able to deliver this. All right, here are the requirements, all the parameters that we can pass. There's a lot. Holy cow. All right. So let's look at some of these examples. Create a VM with minimal options. Looks like we pass in a username a password, uh, the host, that's going to be the Proxmox host, the name of the VM, and then the name of the node. I'm assuming, yeah, that's node. Saber Wolf. But it doesn't say anything about, oh, it does say it's minimal. Uh, let's see a little bit more realistic. Okay, here we go. Uh, clone VM, only source name. This is probably what I'm gonna do once I got a working KVM uh, instance of the VM series, the firewall. Uh, I will probably create a clone uh, and, and reference that instead going forward. But for now, let's see. Let's start working on, let's build our, uh, what do you call it? We're gonna need to build a, an execution environment to handle this. So I've got some reference points that are going to help us tremendously for this 65 GitHub and uh, 
up. Pay no attention to that. There we go. Where is, here we go. Uh, so here is an example. Uh, this is the execution environment that we had created a Docker container with uh, that had the, uh, the Palo Alto Networks um, uh, Ansible collection as well as the Python libraries. Uh, so I'm going to copy this. Uh, let's just go ahead and clone it uh, back into Visual Studio Code. Let's close that out and get clone and clone this repo. I'm going to rename that repo. I'm going to say uh, Ansible EE and Ansible EE. We're going to call this Proxmox. Okay, and we're going to open that directory. And we're going to make some minor changes in order to get things done. So requirements.yaml is going to be where your Ansible collections are. In my case, uh, for the uh, previous image, we had Palo Alto Networks.panos. I don't know if I'm going to need that because this should be a part of the community modules. I wonder if uh, you're reading untamed, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. Uh, Ansible 2.9. I don't know if I need to install a collection for this. We'll find out. We'll find out for sure. But I do know that I need these two Python packages. That much is clear. So for now, let me, uh, let me rename this into backup. YAML. So I don't want this to be included, but in my requirements.txt, that's where we add our Python packages. So I'm going to call it proxmoxer and requests. Okay. Now, when we look at this, what's going to happen is uh, the when we when we run this build process, remember we're using Ansible to build an execution environment. The result is going to be a Docker container, which we can then reference in AWX. So I want to say, uh, ignore this because we're going to, I don't know if we need a, a, a third party collection just yet. Uh, so with that being said, uh, which Python, Python's not installed. So. Uh, there is a, a a file here that's going to allow us to create uh, a virtual environment for us. So poetry install. And it's getting all those goodies. Poetry shell. Now when I type in which Python, I'm inside the Ansible execution environment for, build, uh, for building this. All right. Now the command to actually build the goodies is right down here. Ansible builder. There we go. So we're going to say Ansible builder. I want you to do a build operation. I want you to name this container. Proxmox latest. And oh, it says Docker could not be Found. I uh, Docker PS. Uh, Docker cannot be found. I know I got Docker. Let me just activate it here. Let me load Docker. And under oh, it's it's not running. Maybe that was the problem. Docker was not running on my machine. Let's come back and try this again. Let's uh, type in Docker PS. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So Docker is now uh, running. Let's go ahead and go through this build process. And this is going to, again, build our execution environment with the appropriate uh, Proxmox Python packages, as well as the request library. Now the Proxmoxer Python library probably makes sense, right? It's for uh, doing stuff with Python on Proxmox. The request library that was also required is one of the more popular uh, Python libraries. Its main focus in life is to help you interact with REST APIs. So I'm imagining what's happening here 
I wonder what's in that Proxmoxer package, because usually request is all that you need to interact with an API. I wonder what Proxmoxer brings to the equation. As this build process, it'll take a couple of minutes. Let's just peek into here. Proxmoxer, a Python wrapper for Proxmox REST API. Uh, support services. Uh, let's see, migration, blah, 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 short usage. From Proxmoxer, import Proxmox API, then you create an instance of your Proxmox, uh, validate, ooh, I'm gonna have to enter my username and password. We'll probably need to create another user just for us. Okay, that's not too bad though. Let's do that right now. Back in my Proxmox, let me figure out how to create, let's start with a group. I'm gonna call this group automation, and these are my service accounts. Okay, now that I've got a group, can I add a user to it? Uh, user, add, we're gonna say uh, Ansible is gonna be my username, and the realm, yeah. Uh, looks like there's only one realm. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's one. So I'm just gonna leave. Uh, yikes! Not sure. The group is gonna be automation. Uh, don't care about that stuff unless I need it. Do I need user at Pam? I don't think I need the email part. Yeah, it's gonna be Ansible at Pam. Uh, comment? Nope. Uh, advanced. Don't care about the key IDs. How do permissions get applied? Let's also create an API token. Add user Ansible at Pam. Token ID. Uh, Proxmox token ID. Mm -hmm. Basically the first part Uh, is it, is it just the token? Is the token ID the token? It doesn't, uh, so one exclamation point, uh, value does not pass. Okay. So no token ID is, is something, it's not the token itself. If anyone knows. Feel free to reach out. Uh, API tokens. Token ID. Hmm. I wonder if it just needs to be like an integer. It's probably somewhere in the docs, but I'm just being a little bit lazy now. Mm. Nope, not for that. Uh, tokens, token, token, make compromise. Mm. Token ID equals UUID when making Hmm, I wonder if I need to pass in UUID. Well, let's try it. Ah, that didn't feel right, but we'll just go ahead and run with it. I'm gonna copy this right here, and let's just go ahead and bookmark it in a local file. Oops, new file. Looks like our Ansible uh, build process is still taking a while. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of logs. I wonder if there's like a flag that we can throw to increase like the logging on this. But anyone that's built a container before knows that like there's there's quite a process that, that goes into it. So um, we'll just kind of stand by. Let's hold on to that and say, uh, okay. All right, so I've got the token. I've got the username at Pam. Anything else needed? Says, uh, let's see. Okay. I 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to literally copy and paste. Oh. Oh, that's kind of interesting. They're not even using the, the token. They're just passing username and password. API host, API password, API user. Really interesting. Um, <laughs> why create a token if we're just going to be passing username and password? Eh, oh well. Let's go ahead and copy one of these and let's, uh, let's test this out. So Proxmox KVM and uh, copy and come back into our playbook here. Let's create a new directory called um, Ansible. What was the other one? Provision Proxmox. And let's open that. And we know that we need to create a playbook. That YAML again. Let's let's actually create this with something. Uh, we'll say create VM, and we'll also create another file for inventory.yaml, and we'll create another file for ansible.config. All right. So we've done these things. We're just probably going to speed run this. I think that's probably the most appropriate, considering how much time we've already spent. And I'm going to copy this playbook and I'm going to paste it here. I'm going to cut out a lot of these things. So we're going to call this um, HOU PBE01. I'm going to remove the import of that package. I'm also going to paste in this example right here. A wrong project. See what I'm saying? Like I've got multiple, I've got four instances of VS code open. This is why I was saying in the last video, I typically like to start color coding them so I can figure out quickly which one is doing what. Um, that looks like it's good. My username is going to be Ansible at Pam. Uh, I do not like that. Let's uh, like this. Okay. Uh, Ansible at Pam. The password was Palo Alto one exclamation point. Again, I don't want to confuse Ansible. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap these in quotes. The API host is going to be, I'm going to call this Ansible underscore host. It's going to reference whatever we have listed right here. Uh, the name will be super awesome test 42. And the node I'm going to make the node the same thing right here. We'll deploy on the same host. We'll see if we can get away with that. Uh, I'm going to add an object. So this is going to be create a KVM virtual machine. Proxmox. All right. That looks good. Now let's start creating our, uh, our, uh, our inventory file. I'm going to create all the parent group and inside of there, we're going to say uh, children. And then I'm going to create a, a group called Proxmox. And I'm going to say hosts. And my first host is going to be HOU PBE 01. And we're just going to copy paste a few times. Two, three, four, and five. This represents my five hosts. Uh, and just to make sure that DNS doesn't give us uh, a big, nasty surprise, I'm going to say houpbe01.redtail.com. And uh, I'm just going to, again, copy-paste, y'all. Oops. All right. All right. Cool. These, again, these could have been IP addresses, uh, but we... We spent the time to build it with DNS, so we'll go ahead and consume it. Let me test if I can log in to HOU PBE01. Oops. HOU PBE018006. And get to here. Uh, Ansible at Pam. 
and the password was Palo Alto one exclamation point. Login failed. Is it just Ansible then? Maybe I mistyped my password. Let's see, uh, Palo Alto one exclamation point. I wonder if this is a permissions issue. Let's see, let's come back into roles. And how do I apply a role to a group? Group. There's nothing really there for that. Uh, maybe I do permissions. All right, Proxmox experts, chime in. Uh, I think we're unable to log in because of the permissions issue, but I'm having a hard time finding where I can associate the permissions. I was hoping to do it at a group level. Key IDs. Feel like I'm going down the wrong route. This doesn't feel right. Permissions, permissions, user. It's part of the automation group. It's enabled, doesn't expire. So I cannot apply permissions here. Check. At the groups. I cannot apply permissions here. Check. All right. Uh, let's see. There's roles. These are good. How do I assign these? Is that where a realm comes in? No, I, do, I honestly don't think so. That's That doesn't seem like it would be the right spot. Hmm. All right. Uh, apply roles to group permissions proxmox. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. Uh, do I have to do this from the permissions roles from the data center and click create? That's to create the roles. I don't want to create a role. I just want to assign one. Yeah, don't care. Don't care. Create a new role. Mm. Uh, assign the role happens at the group layer. Is it not possible to use the GUI for this? I'm assuming the answer to that is no. All right, so... No, there has to be a way because we can't just do the shell on all five hosts. That doesn't seem right. You can give a uh, blah, 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 blah. See, this is cool, but like you have to be on an individual host for that. Am I going to have to repre uh, reproduce this on every single host in my environment? It's a little annoying if that's the case. Let's see, users, host. 
Fascinating. Permissions don't even show up. no permissions on the host itself. You have to do it at the data center level. But how do you... Hmm, there's no shell for the data center. The data center is a logical construct, so... Let's, hmm, let's try it anyway. Let's jump on a single host. Let me paste in this command right here. And we're going to say PBE UM ACL modify user ansible at PAM role it is going to be. What are my roles? Uh, administrator. All right. Role administrator. All right. That looked like it worked, or at least it took it took it. Let's log in again. Login failed. Maybe I just I'm entering the wrong password. That would be great if that was the problem. But the roles thing is really, that shouldn't be the way that it is, if that's the case. Let's come back up to users, Ansible, password, paste in what we've got in our clipboard. User Ansible does not exist. What? Wow. Okay. All right. So look at that. We, when we made the change from the command line, we got all the goody permissions. So you have to jump on one of the hypervisors, make the change that we did, uh, which was this. But in doing so, it's almost as if that messed up username Ansible at Pam. All right, let's try to log back in with Ansible at Pam. What a nightmare, Proxmox. Why are you so bad at this? Let's do this. Let's uh let's remove this user. All right. Uh, do I need to refresh this information or something? Let's refresh this. Can I update TFA config? Uh, did not promise. Three. So it looks like there's like the, the change that I made on the local host to give myself permissions was not propagated to these other devices. Um, that's, that's how I'm reading that message. So do I need to run that command on all five of them? I'm guessing that's my only other option at this point because everything else is failing. Let's go ahead and copy this here. And 
paste this here. Nope, that was the... Let's see. Hey, thank you. Appreciate the follow. Uh, let's move this down to... Oh, I cannot copy it from the shell directly. So I'm going to have to type this out manually each time. Yeah, I, I think this user experience could be just a little bit better, Proxmox. Uh, just a little bit better. Let's see. Let's copy this command. Uh, wait, did I add it at the group layer? Okay. PV um acl modify user ansible at pam role administrator okay let's do three now okay let's do four all right and let's do five Terrible. I hope I'm doing that wrong. I really do. But I've got a problem to where I'm not able to log in. So I don't know really who's at fault. It's a little... Hmm. Dude, Proxmox, Proxmox indeed, and Proxmox indeed. Proxmox is driving me crazy right now. So we, we just stood up like a, an entire data center of Proxmoxes. We're trying to automate it. We're trying, we built some Ansible playbooks. We're gonna deploy some virtual machines on these Proxmox hosts. We created a username, we created a, a group. We associated permissions to that username and group. And we are unable, ah. Oh my God. Ah, oh, check this out guys. <laughs> enabled equals no. I love it. I love it. Uh, enabled. Yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, hilarity will ensue if I log in right now. Okay. Well, uh, at Pam. So yeah, Proxmox. Drive me crazy. Drive me crazy. What's going on here, man? What's going on? Why can I not log in? Uh, let's set password. It's uh, Paolo Alto one exclamation point. Ah, oh, man. All right. So I'm fully capable of admitting user error. Uh, and I will recognize that I'm probably at fault here. Definitely was at fault for not having this enabled. Uh, yes, of course. Hmm. Uh, Ansible at Pam enabled. Key IDs. This brings me back. I haven't used Proxmox in like a decade. Back in the open VC. Yeah, containers. It is good stuff. Uh, yeah, the, where we started was like I was using a, a vCenter inside of my home environment. And vCenter is awesome. Uh, I love it. But um, I, I wanted to, to try automating Proxmox. And so we're here uh version 7.3 and it's it's i mean honestly it's it's great it it it's working well i i feel like it right we've got some compute we've we've deployed some kubernetes uh some apps on top of a kubernetes host like so we've got some workloads doing some things and for that it's just, it's exactly what you want but if you've used proxmox before and your experience is similar to mine then you've probably recognized the kind of annoying factor that you got to know where to go and what to do in order to accomplish your goal. And sometimes it's through the GUI and sometimes it's through the command line. 
Uh, and I think that's where, I mean, like we're, we're running into a problem right there. vCenter is always compatibility issues. that's prevented me from using it at home. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've had compatibility issues. Um, uh, I think, uh, back when it relied on Adobe flash, there was some real nasty stuff with that. If you're not using vCenter, you're not using Proxmox. I'd be like really interested in knowing what you are using. Because I'm sure the problem hasn't gone away. The need for virtualization hasn't gone away. So you're probably using something. Let's see. Permissions look good. Password. And if I if I if I try to enter a password here, it's just anything. I'm told that the user doesn't exist. It's letting me edit the username, but it tells me it does, doesn't exist. And if I try to remove it, it's going to tell me that it doesn't exist. Uh, so I do not see, I don't see the username and Etsy password, which is usually where you see uh, your usernames in their groups and such. So I'm looking at this, like we've got two different realms that these users are on. Um, there's Pam and there's Proxmox VE authentication server. Let's create a user on the Proxmox VE authentication server. Gennetti. Is that, am I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I've never heard of that before. Gennetti. Uh, Midrain virtualization solution. Is this uh I'm assuming this is like a KVM based virtualization. Let's see. Oh, it was developed by Google. It uses either Zen, KVM, or Lexi. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh let's see. Looks like it's fairly recently updated. Virtualization. <laughs> nice read me. I love it. <laughs> Straight to the point. Pretty cool. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, I'm gonna like that one and check it out later. I'm assuming if virtualization isn't like top of need for you anymore, you might have either changed careers or you've gotten to like uh, containerization or the Kubernetes space. Uh, Let's create a user called automation. Password will be Palo Alto one exclamation point. Palo Alto one exclamation point. The group will be automation. Uh, and it is enabled add. Um, interesting, look at that, man. The Ansible user just suddenly became disabled. Why? Why? Why would that happen? Enable. Go. Do your thing. Um, all right. Let's try automation at PVE then. Automation at PVE. Back into here. Uh, automation at PVE and Palo Alto 1 exclamation point. Oh, wrong realm. That's not going to work. There we go. Oh boy. Ah, there we go. We finally did it, ladies and gentlemen. That was uh, just a little painful. All right, so it's going to be automation at PBE. And there we go. There we go. That's fine. Get away from me. All right. Uh, change careers. They do programming now. Hey, me too. That's actually the... <laughs> That was the the genesis of all of this. We're, we're we're setting up a new lab for 2023. 
Uh, we were doing uh, some Ansible automation. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of Python programming inside of here, uh, but we, we stood up Kubernetes. Uh, we're building some playbooks. We're gonna be deploying some VMs. Um, I'd be interested, like what kind of programming are you doing? Is it is it for is it for infrastructure? Is it actual software developed, like you're writing apps or web development? Be really interested in knowing, especially like where you came from and how that conversion has taken place. I know what it looks like for me, and <laughs> was not easy, uh, but it's uh, it's just opened up millions of new avenues for my personal career. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So let's go through here and try to create a VM. Let's see if all this is gonna work. Oh, uh, we need to check in on that Docker container build. Uh, where'd that container go? Is it, uh... yeah, okay. So uh, we've successfully uh, built the container image that's got all of our packages and dependencies on it. I'm going to let's see if it'll allow me to push this. Uh, I do not think I have uh, Docker. Okay, maybe it will work. All right, so uh, Docker push, Xbox. There we go. Oh, on authenticate. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I need to authenticate into uh, GitHub in order to push my container image. Let me see if I can't just set up something on Docker Hub instead. Docker Hub. Java distributed enterprise stuff. Uh, oh yeah, it still is your hobby. Cool. That's so cool. Um, that sounds like it's a lot of fun. Let's see. Register, we'll call this uh, pan office hours. And what is my proton? There's an email address that I got somewhere around here. Java is like, I mean, Java gets a bad rep from a lot of people that don't know Java, but uh, maybe it's difficult to work with. I'm not entirely sure, but for me, I think that uh, <clears throat> Java is one of those things that just never seems to want to go away. Uh, on office hours. Okay, show in large type. Yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. So it's, uh, and we're just going to create a simple password. Okay, fine. We'll enter something a little bit better than that. Just kidding. Uh, stairs. Oh my God, <laughs> these captures are making me feel like I'm intoxicated. Uh, there we go. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, probably need to uh, authenticate or validate my doctor, no? I didn't need to do that. All right, that's fine. Uh, let's do free. Oh, okay, yes, it do. Spam. Java gets a bad rep because students hate it. Yeah, for backend stuff, it's still king. It's one of those things that isn't fun to write, but is less of a headache to maintain a large project. Interesting. The desktop application Java is like people associated with that, but the backend, yeah, uh, Java it, uh, architecture is is quite unique, and uh, yeah, I always got confused. Like, do I need to install the Java runtime engine, or do I need to install um, the actual uh, JDK? Like, what is it? Let's go ahead and click confirm, uh, and then all the Java apps. Like, I'm a I'm a, a network infrastructure uh, cybersecurity 
type person. Uh, and so like in the late nineties and early two thousands, uh, pretty much like all the GUI tools that we had to do our job were Java based and they were terrible. And it's not necessarily a problem of the language itself. It's just like the, the Java applets that we were using were just garbage. And so, um, yeah, not a fun time. Uh, let's uh, log in here, Dr. Login. And pan office hours. Enter my super secret password. Hopefully, uh, login succeeded. Okay, let me do this. Let me, uh, Dr. Images. I'm going to rebrand my tag. I'm not going to upload this to GitHub, so I'm going to remove um, this uh, uh, from it. So we're going to instead say... Docker tag, um, is it T or is it just, uh, this is like when you create an alias on your Linux system, I always forget, like, is it the source, then destination or destination and then source, which one goes first? Uh, I'm going to say Docker tag. I'm going to use the, um, the source first latest, and we're going to call this Ansible EE Proxmox latest. We'll see if that works uh docker images yeah looks like it worked all right so docker push i'm gonna push up the ansible execution environment proxmox to our uh why what's your beef what's what's going on here um denied request access to the resources denied am i not allowed to upload my own images the docker hub turn into um uh, what's the deal uh content subscriptions my profile create repository um using one is uh okay uh we'll call this um ansible ee and that's fine um Oh, gross. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So what we'll do is we'll update that tag. So we'll run the same command again. Docker tag. Uh, source is Ansible EE builder latest. And we're going to call this um, Ansible EE. And we'll tag it as proxmox so we're just trying to conform to some of the uh naming conventions used on docker hub let's see oh ansible builder proxmox all right now i should be able to do a docker push ansible ee proxmox oh um, ah we got my username. Okay. One more time for the people up front. We're going to go right here. Pan office hours slash boom. Haven't used Docker hub in years and it shows Docker push. Yay. All right. We're pushing our containers up there. Ah, terrific. <laughs> we're almost, we're almost there. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so uh, what have we done thus far? Uh, we've deployed uh, Proxmox on five hosts. We created a data center of them. Uh, haven't really touched them very much. We created a user group uh, and added a, a local user uh, associated permissions. We had to visit all five Proxmox hosts to get that done. Actually, that doesn't feel right. I think I was doing something wrong. I, I don't think I should have selected PAM. I think I should have always selected PVE as the authoritative. Uh, I think that really messed it up. Um, so uh, then create an API token, which was useless because this Ansible module actually just uses username and password combo. So yeah, but learning process. Uh, we stood up a, uh, a Ubuntu host, installed uh, uh, Rancher K3S, deployed AWX operator, then used that to deploy Ansible AWX on top of Kubernetes. Uh, set all that up, set up uh, projects, SSH keys, 
set up playbooks, username, password, RBAC. Uh, and now we are finalizing a custom Ansible execution environment with the appropriate Proxmox uh, container or uh, 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 packages and kind of crossing our fingers that we don't need to install another Ansible collection. But once this is complete, we'll be able to add the container image into our AWX, which will then enable us to start automating the deployment of new virtual machines uh, on Proxmox. That's the hope. That is the hope. How big is this container image, man? It's, uh, it's looking pretty feisty. So uh, if you've never looked at a, a Docker build process before, um, this isn't a Docker build, but this is a Docker push. And it, it's kind of uh, kind of works in a similar capacity in that a Docker file at the end of the day is a set of instructions in a text file. Looks like this. Right? This is uh, this is what takes place. Um, now, this one's a little, a little bit complicated because it's using a second container image. Don't worry about this. But basically, a Docker file is a text file uh, with certain instructions that you send to the Docker server backend and tell it how you want your container images to be built. And then uh, it's built in layers, right? So think of this as like a, like a Big Mac, right? I'm American. I talk to fast food. All right, so uh, think of this as a Big Mac where you've got like, you know, a layer, top layer for your bread, then you got your secret sauce, then you got onions, then you got, you know, tomatoes and lettuce and, you know, your meat and blah, blah, blah. You got all these different layers, but they all together form a hamburger. It's effectively what happens with Docker container images without the secret sauce part, of course. Um, but it's, it's that each... Uh, each line inside of the Docker file is a separate layer. And this is a really intuitive uh, type of uh, uh, process because what it enables you to do is that uh, if, if something changed on one of these individual lines, that layer would just need to be rebuilt. Uh, and, and unfortunately, all the subsequent layers below it as well would need to be rebuilt. But this is helpful if you build a lot of Docker container images uh, because the build process can be extremely small eventually uh, once you've kind of like uh, solidified the, the build out of your container image. And so like rebuilding and, and pushing and such is, is, a, is a, a small process. All right, uh, let's come back into Docker Hub and refresh our page. We should now see we've got a Docker image available right here. Uh, it's, uh, we'll copy this. We'll move back over into Ansible. Log in and let's create a new Proxmox execution environment for our new container. So we're going to call this, uh, Proxmox. The image is this. The tag is Proxmox. We're going to tell it to always pull. Uh, the Redtail org, and we don't need a credential again because this is publicly available. Let's go ahead and clone it uh, or start it. Now, here's an annoyance with Ansible AWX, and I hope one day that you fix this. Ansible Red Hat, if you're, if you're listening to me, fix this, please. There needs to be a button to initiate the pull operation because, again, if there's a problem somewhere either with the name of your image, the tag of your image, or the registry credential. If there's a problem there, you're never gonna find out about it unless you jump into the container logs uh, within Kubernetes. And that is just, it's just a bad user experience at the end of the day. So what we'll do is we'll kind of hijack this demo template that shipped with Ansible right out of the gate. And I'm just gonna associate it to the Proxmox uh, execution environment. Ah, let's see, I cannot because it's actually part of the wrong org. Uh, okay, so we'll create a, uh, fine, we'll just duplicate this uh, 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 project or template. And I'm gonna call this um, Proxmox Execution Environment Test. And we're gonna select the execution environment as Proxmox. Uh, and fine, let's go ahead and save it. This will not run successfully. Like the play is not going to execute because we're using a different execution environment. 
but I just want to make sure that we're able to pull down the execution environment as that one-time operation. Uh, I want to figure out any credentials and issues before we go down the, the rabbit hole of, of starting to provision VMs. So we'll click the launch button here. Let's see what we get back. Hmm. The error that I'm looking for is something regarding uh, cannot find the Ansible module, pan, blah, 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 blah. If it's anything else, then I know that it's going to be a problem with my credentials. Let's see if we can't jump into the Kubernetes logs and capture this as it takes place. Uh, AWS task is going to be under execution environment, maybe. There used to be a way of saying this. Uh, pull the Ah, uh, okay, good, good. This is the error that we were looking for. This tells me that inside the, the execution environment, we were not able to find this, this specific Ansible module. Uh, I just needed to get this far, right? This tells me that we were able to at least clone the Proxmox execution environment. So we're in a good standing. Let us upload this to a new GitHub uh, repo. So we'll revisit github.com and we'll say a new repository and we'll call this uh, Proxmox, uh, what do we want to call this? Proxmox uh, provision, sure. And we'll make it public. Uh, don't add the readme, create the repository. Uh, so this process is a little bit different than the one we did before. Previously, we had added a thing like a readme and a git ignore file, and it just instantiated the, the repo uh, for us. But now I'm saying, hey, I've got some files on my local machine, and I want them to be pushed up there. So we're going to follow a little bit different operation. We're going to uh, copy this that we've got right here, and we're going to paste this right here. This will get the readme up there. Right, let's refresh. The readme is up here. Uh, so I am synchronizing files, but I haven't synchronized all my files. Let's do that now. Let's click up here and say uh, initial VM provision test. Now, honestly, the probably the best practice for me to do at this point would be to, uh, to test locally on my machine. But as you saw last time, when you're bouncing between a local Ansible environment and a in the GUI in AWX, there are some things that you can step on your own toes with regarding like inventory files and in uh, secrets and uh, and in groups and blah blah blah. It 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 can be an it can be a mess. So I'm just gonna try to execute this from uh, the GUI and leave the local stuff out and see if I don't yell at myself for that later. All right, we need to add the remote remote repository that we just added. So let's do that. Code and copy. And let's add a new project. We're going to call this, uh, yeah, this is a git. And add the source control. So proxmox dash provision. The organization is Redtail. Uh, source control credential is that. And I don't need to clone this through a separate execution environment. So I'll just keep that as the default and update revision at launch. Click save. And we should be able to synchronize our project now. All right. And so now we should be able to create a playbook. So. Let's create this. We're going to call this uh, provision VM on Proxmox. And the inventory, oh, we'll need to address that here shortly. We'll select demo for now. Uh, the project is going to be Proxmox provision. Execution environment is going to be Proxmox. That's the container that we just built. And Proxmox, uh, the playbook is going to be create VM.yaml. Now, if you remember, our credentials are hard-coded here. <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't have done that, but hey, it's a little bit too late uh, to pull it down from GitHub. So we'll just do that as it is now. If you guys can hack me, and this isn't a challenge, but if, the, if you guys can hack me, then it's a failure on my own 
home network security. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's create a an inventory of our Proxmox servers. So that will be Proxmox uh, VE. Select the right org and click save. And then we're going to create a group called Proxmox. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And inside the group, we're gonna start adding some hosts. So let's add a new host. Let's pick on our first contestant, uh, HOUPBE01. And let's hard code the, uh, the host name in with DNS so that we don't run into a DNS issue. Uh, click save. And that's fine for now. Uh, that, that, that should be all that we need. Uh, back here, let's now update our inventory file to reference our Proxmox inventory. Oops, wrong one. There we go, Proxmox VE, and hit save. And let's see if this works. Uh, container pull operation shouldn't take more than a second. Let's see. All right, uh, looks to be a problem task. Uh, it didn't really help us as far as like the output. This isn't really helpful output. Let's look at this again. Task Proxmox KVM is here. Let's look at our playbook. What did we do wrong? Task, uh, ch -ch 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 did I structure that wrong? Uh, name, well, name is optional. Right, so you, you, you can have an op, I thought it was optional, maybe they changed it, but uh, let's see. Deploy VM on Proxmox. Uh, let's just uh, kind of compare this for a second. This looks good. There's uh, This is the name of the Ansible module. Maybe we need to pull in the community modules. Maybe that's the, the rub. Yeah, because it can't find it. All right, so how to import uh, community Ansible modules into playbook. You know, I, I'm using search uh, with Brave. It's kind of inconsistent, it's, it's hit or miss. Um, what I've started to use is chat GPT. Uh, as a replacement for my Google searches. And I'm kind of tempted uh, to give it a whirl here, but uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, um, uh, open, open AI, I think is the right, dot com. Uh, let's use chat GPT. Let's, uh, oh, it's, it's at capacity. Okay. Well, you know, all these things always break when you're trying to do something live. All right. Uh, let's close that out. Close that out. Um, the challenge is how to import Proxmox community uh, modules into Ansible. I'm just going to click on all of these things and hopefully someone's got a good example for us. Uh, specify. Oh, that's the issue. We have to. Oh, so we do have to install. Oh, God bless America. All right. So we're going to have to do a rebuild of our container image. Sorry, folks. Uh, it's just the way of the world sometimes. Let's add back in our collections. Uh, we're going to type in community.general. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to go through the entire build process. Hopefully, we can leverage the uh, the build process of a container image and not have to deal that. Let's see here. Ansible build. The tag is now proxmox. Ansible EE. And this is now uh, pan office. Hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, dependency requires my, it does not YAML. Uh, oh, uh, we have renamed it. Okay, there we go. 
Let's try that again. Okay, and we'll probably need to change our playbook as well uh, to reference uh, community.general. We'll need to prepend these right here like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and update with appropriate namespace. There we go. And let's come back into Ansible and let's tell it to do a synchronization on our GitHub project. So we'll refresh this. Uh, let me look back in the execution environment. Let me just make sure we set it to always sync. And yeah, okay. So it'll always pull the container image. Perfect. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the color of this one to um, Azure Blue. So blue will be for Docker. Uh, what else we got here? Ansible test. I'll close that out. And uh, this one, Palo Alto, will be, um, let's see, we got orange or something. That's fine enough. And then uh, for this one where we're doing Proxmox, I don't know. We'll pick uh, Proxmox will be, sure, it'll be red. Um, we're fine. Okay, so here we go. Just waiting on the, the build process to complete for our container image. I'm hoping this is going to be the last of it. I think my dogs are hoping it too because they're, they're looking at me like they really got to go pee. <laughs> yeah, please do that. Please let the puppies pee. So, listen, the, the Docker build process doesn't usually take this long. I think one of the problems is, is that uh, we're working from a virtual machine, and within that virtual machine, we're working inside a nested Ubuntu uh, Linux instance running as WSL2. And inside of that, we're building uh, Docker container images. So um, not to give excuses as to why this build process has taken so long, but uh, there are some uh, technical reasons I think it's, it's causing the delay. 
again, it would be great if uh, if Ansible gave us the opportunity to to kind of output the little logs as they're going through. Hey, Joe. Come here, bub. Hey. You guys have been so good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, all right. This is making me wish that I got paid by the hour. This is hilarious. So we executed the build six minutes ago and it's still kind of spinning around. Let's see if there's anything else that we didn't cover. Uh, we talked about uh, the open B switch, the bridges. Uh, we did not, we did not build out the networking like we had promised. Uh, so that's a to do item. Another was we talked about setting up a uh, developer.servicenow.com. So uh, if you ever wanted to kind of create a GUI for your Ansible, this is a killer way of doing it. Uh, ServiceNow is uh, a huge, uh, let's see here, let's sign in, let's create a new one. I'm gonna call this, my first name is Pan. Uh, not used it before, but I'm definitely not experienced with it. Yeah, it's uh, and office hours is my name. <laughs> office hours at proton. Me. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's it's one of those things that's like um, it's incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful, but is uh kind of a a headache. <laughs> if I'm being a little bit honest with you, um. There's so many components, uh, and sometimes to really unlock a lot of the functionality, uh, you kind of got to break into JavaScript, which is kind of interesting. Um, it, if I m remember correctly, ServiceNow is built on the original Angular, uh, Angular JS, uh, not not Angular, but Angular JS, uh, and in building a service like ServiceNow on top of that web framework, you unlock like a lot of really great functionality. Uh, there's a lot of really cool things you can just kind of break out and script and, and kind of get around it. But um, honestly, you, it's like it's like working in any framework. You got to know the way that things are called. You got to know how things kind of stitch together and work together. Uh, and sometimes it's a real pain in order to do that. So let's, uh, let me create a, uh, a, uh, there we go. Yep. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. Has been verified. Let's log in ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but what I like to do uh, is I like to create, uh, basically self-service forms that are, um, mapped directly to my Ansible playbooks. And that form could be something like, hey, build a virtual machine or configure my firewall or, you know, this or that. And basically all the all the form fields, all the input that's passed into there by the user gets compiled into an API uh, into some like JSON body and pushed to the Ansible API. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've read. Thank you. So let's start building. Oh, okay. And it'll, it takes a second for them. Uh, looks like it's already up. Uh, so if like a lot of customers, a lot of uh, people that I talk with in my industry, uh, they, they want to get into writing automation. They want to start learning how to code things. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest hurdles that they have is not, it's not just learning how to code, but it's also learning how to operate and and how to um how to understand the workflows of like when you're in an automated environment how do you do the tasks that we used to do from you know command line uh or through the gui and so that becomes quite a big hurdle 
Uh, and so ServiceNow, front-ending your automation with ServiceNow, and then again, tying it into an Ansible playbook is a way that really helps people adopt automation because it's like ServiceNow is usually like, it's in almost, it's in a lot of environments. Um, and so people already use it today or they're familiar with it. Um, and it, again, it just really simplifies the way that people can consume automation. Uh, how's my container build going? Is that done yet? Thank the heavens. Let's push it. Let's push it. Dr. Push, this guy, uh, we should now start to see, going back to talking about the Docker container uh, layers, since each layer has like its own individual uh, UUID, uh, you can see like the first few digits over on the left-hand side. Uh, but since these layers did not change, then there's nothing that needs to be uh, pushed back up. The only thing that really changed is that we added uh, a new dependency, a new uh, Ansible collection into our container, which was like, you know, just uh, one one addition to it. So the the other subsequent additions or the other subsequent layers did not need to get pushed back up into GitHub or into Docker Hub. So that's really cool. Um, so that should be done. I'm curious how big this image is because that took that took like 10 minutes or it felt longer in order to build Docker images. How big is this? It's a gig. Whew. Ansible. Whew. Whew. You got to trim that down, my friends. I know you're probably using like a CentOS based image or a RHEL based image or something. You got to switch to Alpine. That is way too big. Uh, what are they using? Actually, we have the instructions. Let's look at that uh, Docker file work build, blah, 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 from EE builder image as builder. So whatever that translates to, well, that's just for the builder image. What's the EE base image? What kind of secret stuff are they doing around here? Uh, output, uh, that's not it. Uh, builder requirements. Nope, 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 nope. All right. I, I'm, I'm almost positive. It's probably something like CentOS or RHEL or uh, something similar, but a gig. Who? Oh, it's defined right up here. Quay image Ansible. Okay, so it's based off another image uh, from uh, from their own internal. Quay.io is uh, Red Hat's internal container registry. Um, so if you ever see that, that's what you're looking at. So, okay, yeah. All right, whatever. Doesn't matter. Uh, let's get back into the fun stuff. Let's uh, let's run our playbook again. It should do a pull operation and download that freaking gig container image yet again. Uh, but hopefully now it has the uh, the right SDK, the right libraries, and it's got the um, the right execution environment. Let's see. Uh, software defined networking is pretty cool. Yeah, software defined networking. Uh, the the actual phrase SDN software defined networking never took off. Uh, it 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 took off in the um um and like the the uh, what am I talking about like the um, I want to say the educational space. I, uh, but like in theory, like it sounded like it was a really good idea. Um, but, oh, am I using the wrong playbook again? I am. We'll fix that. Um, in, in theory, a lot of what SDN promised sounded like a great idea, like decoupling your forwarding plane from your control plane, throw out like really dumb devices at the edge, and then just have like some kind of central orchestrator provision those things, uh, via software. The reality was just a little bit different. Like the real world didn't hold up, um, uh, problems with, uh, forwarding performance, um, all kinds of issues. Uh, that ultimately made SDN kind of like dead on arrival. Uh, so unfortunately, SDN never really became a thing. Um, yeah, that's just how it is, man. Yeah, OpenFlow. That's right. Uh, OpenFlow was was part of SDN. Uh, that was like the the primary protocol that was used uh, for the uh, programming of the ASICs and the forwarding plane. Uh, but um, yeah, it's again 
uh, it's one of those things like, uh, in theory sounds great, but in practice just, just was not feasible. Like, uh, networking is really hard. Networking is really, really hard. Uh, it's not something that you can just kind of wave like a magic wand around and solve it because you're not just dealing with, uh, the, the logic meaning like how to forward this application out this port and whatnot. There's not just like the, the logic part that, that SDN promised to solve, but there's actually the, the performance, the forwarding, the ASICs, the hardware component of getting packets on the wire at line rate. Uh, that's, it's a hard thing for, uh, to solve both of those problems and SDN just never really did it. So as an industry, we, 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 we shifted away from SDN like technologies and we just, uh, we focus on using software practices, automation, writing code, writing playbooks, writing this, writing that scripts. Um, we use that now as our, our provisioning mechanism rather than waiting for like an open flow, uh, standard to, to do the job for us. All right. Uh, let's see. Cannot resolve Panos. That must be using the wrong playbook. Uh, everything about this looks wrong. Uh, come back over into templates, Proxmox EE test. Oh, uh, that is the wrong playbook. Uh, we want to do use provision VM on Proxmox. So I did select the wrong one. All right. So again, this will be like the, we have to pull down the container image again. Uh, hopefully, oh, it didn't take too long. And all right, so we made some progress. Let's see, the module is not found, Proxmoxer. I believe this is the same problem that we ran into earlier where Python has these uh, these virtual environments and we need to tell it to, to use the Python interpreter from our playbook. So we solved this earlier uh, by creating the group variables and uh, let's do that again. So create VM. Let's create a new folder here. Uh, make dir, we're going to say group vars, and we'll call it proxmox. And uh, oops, dash p. There we go. And let's add a file inside of there for our uh, for our Python interpreter. Really, that's what it is. So we'll just call it python.yaml. And we'll just do a nice little copy paste. Let's close this guy out, get out of here. And let's come back over to here. Let's, where's that fix? There we go. Let's use this and dump it right there. I feel pretty confident that this is the, the root issue. Uh, the error message is identical to the one that we ran before. And again, this is just a well-known issue with, with Ansible. It just really struggles to find the right Python interpreter just enough to drive you crazy um get status yeah i thought so so get add all get commit message adding python fix get push all right and let's run this back again so yeah no module found proxmoxer which makes me think that it's just it's looking it's looking for love in all the wrong places and we need to tell it, Hey, calm down, calm down. Ah, much better, much better, much better, much better. Okay. So it was able to find the module. So we're not getting that error message anymore. What it's telling us now is that this host does not exist in the cluster. And that's kind of true. The host does exist, but it doesn't exist at the name. Like it doesn't have the suffix, the DNS suffix appended at the end of it, right? So uh, my inventory is uh, needs to be dressed up just a little bit. Let's come back over into our inventories and Proxmox VE. Let's look at hosts and, oh, Ansible host, uh, the name is right. That is the name of my host. So let's look at the playbook. 
Maybe I'm calling this wrong. Uh, deploy. No, that's... Man, that's good. Maybe DNS inside of the container isn't able to find it. Uh, let's look back at that job. What did it say? Node blah, blah, blah does not exist in this cluster. Hmm. Node. Uh, so let's look at the parameters that need to be passed up here. Let's look at node. And let's look at what they're asking for. Proxmox VE mode, where the new VM will be created, only required for state equals present. For others, it will be auto-discovered. State equals present. So state, state is what enables us to say whether or not we want to create or delete a specific resource. If the state is equal to present, that means we want to create it. If it's absent, it will be deleted. Uh, it usually they sh they should say what the default is. Um, I don't think we passed state on ours. Let's look. Uh, we did not. We did not. Um, uh, maybe this is the. Oh, th this is the problem. This is the problem right here. Okay, so we tried to get away with something clever uh, and it's blowing up in our face. So what we did is remember in our inventory.yaml, uh, the Ansible host is hard-coded with the domain name. And then we reference that inside of here. But what I should have done is I, sh I should have uh, just typed it instead of, yeah. So we're going to say H-O-U-P-V-E-0-1. That's going to be the issue that we had. Uh, so uh, correct node. And let's run this again. Uh, earlier, I felt really confident with some of these playbooks where I had uh, placed a wager on this, including <laughs> shaving my head. Naming my dogs. Um, <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna do such wagers anymore because I've already been proven wrong about eight times today. Uh, so we're just gonna leave this off. Let's see here. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're making progress. Um, permission permission check failed. VMID one o two. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're just like stepping through these problems. Uh, let's see, let's read this again. Uh, VM2 with VMID 01 failed with exception 403 permitting permission check failed. Now we're using the username of automation at PVE and it is an administrator. So there should be no opportunity for permissions to be a problem. But here we are. Here we are. Let me refresh this page. Not reboot. Refresh. There's a big difference. Big difference. Uh, yes, it definitely did not get through. Let's look at the permissions on my automation user. It is enabled. Automation at PVE. Let's look at its permissions. Uh, where did all my permissions go? Uh, maybe I didn't add the permissions on the PBE. Maybe I only did that on the, uh, the user itself. So let's do that. Let's jump back into the shell and hit the up arrow here. Let's look at, okay, role administrator. So PBE and the username is automation. Did that take? It looked like it took. Let's update all these guys. Actually, no, let's just pick on that guy because he's the only one doing anything. Let's rerun this playbook. Right now, the problems that we're dealing with aren't necessarily anything related to Ansible or GitHub or permissions or the playbook. It's permissions on the remote uh, hypervisor, which is Proxmox. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, we did it. We did it. I'm so proud of us. All right. Uh, looks like we've successfully deployed a VM. Uh, it's about as bare, as, as bare minimum as it could be. 
We created a VM called Super Awesome Test 42. Let's look back over here. There we go. There is Super Awesome Test 42. Super slick. Uh, now there's nothing on here. There's no disk. I don't think there's uh, what's on the hardware. Uh, so this is the default. If you don't specify anything in the playbook, it'll give it half a gig of RAM, a single processor, no network, no disk, uh, nothing, no ISO. I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's bare minimum, right? That's, that's kind of what we knew going into this, but really cool. Um, yeah, I like this. I like this. I think uh, my next steps are to get, uh, let's go ahead and delete this guy. Uh, my next steps are to get a Palo Alto uh, VM series firewall uh, as, a, as a template inside of here. Like I have the Ubuntu template that we used earlier to deploy uh, our Kubernetes host. Um, get something similar and then switch out my Proxmox module. Let's kind of close this out to 100%. Uh, switch out the Proxmox module to reference the clone VM and then to, to, do a, yeah, to do this operation. So we'll do a clone of the PA VM, give it a name, uh, and we should be good to go. With that, we should be able to deploy, ah, yeah, I, you know, I'm wondering if this is going to be an issue. I don't think we need to declare the, the network interface because we'll be working off of a cloned VM, which the network interfaces will already be declared. So I don't think we need to do that. Uh, and same thing goes with the disk, right? Working off a clone, uh, working off a template kind of alleviates us from having to declare our resources like this. Uh, it'll definitely make our life super easy. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've been here for four and a half hours. Uh, if you've been here for the whole four and a half hours, um, pat yourself on the back. <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate it. I think we covered a ton of really good ground. Uh, we've, we've got my lab in an environment where uh, we can start doing some automation for firewall config policy. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, we've, we've deployed VMs. We set up Proxmox. We got all the goodies. I got dogs making weird sounds at me, which is an indication that they're ready to go outside. Uh, so that's it uh, for today. Uh, we'll be back next week. Probably won't be another four and a half hour stream. Probably be just like a, a couple of hours. <laughs> Daryl, calm down, buddy. Calm down. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. Uh, but anyway, uh, again, thanks for hanging out. Uh, we covered a lot. We'll set up the ServiceNow stuff uh, to talk to the API of Ansible. Uh, we'll have a VM series uh, uh, clone to where we can just deploy uh, all willy-nilly, and we can start fully automating our...